Greetings, salutations, hello, welcome, hi, friends. Thank you for joining us. Welcome to another exciting episode of Roundtable Live. I'm Bear Taffy, Rockley Smile, Mathis Games, Northern Lion. The gang's all here to talk to you about video games, the industry, and the world surrounding it. Thanks for joining us. Hi, guys. Hello. hello. What was that? Russian. Ah, well, I should have known that. Mm. It's a pretty no, you should. I should have <laughs> come on. You set a bar <laughs> higher for me for like my my, level, my levels of cultural understanding. They need to be expanded. We got a good docket today. We got a lot of games to talk about. It's been a week. I apologize for the uh, for the break there, as I spent some time in good old Arizona, which I got I got three things. I've told you guys a couple of them. Three things that I, I think like embody my Arizona experience for you that I saw. One okay. gas station museum which is about what it sounds like. It's a museum of relics of an old gas station, which was probably the most interesting part of Williams, Arizona. Uh, two, Confederate's flag sticker on a golf cart in the middle of the street. <laughs> and then number three, probably my favorite, was a car window decal of Calvin pissing on the word Hillary, which right, was yes. really just like nailed it on the I'm head. Not I'm not sure if that embodies Arizona or just the entirety of the South. <laughs> Anytime I've gone to like Georgia or Texas, that just rings true yeah. throughout. Mm. <laughs> Unless you're in like one of those like uh, the bigger cities tend to be like more like um, uh, Democratic leaning in like a, a sea of conservative. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's interesting about like Salt Lake City too. Kind of has that same vibe where it's just sort of like everybody's come together in the core, and then I, all the outskirts kind of have a different vibe. Not that there's anything wrong with that inherently. Let's just put the you know no, it's, it's just don't want to draw a line on the sand there. or anything. It strikes me as kind of odd to even decorate a golf cart at all. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I'm with <laughs> you on that. Yeah, you're that into it that you need to decorate your golf cart. I think it's but kind of like is a, it a golf cart or is it like. It, it's a tool for mobility in exactly. that neighborhood. Exactly. It's not like, like they're taking it to the course. They're just like, I need to go to the store. I don't want to get in my car. It's like, like when you have like a, an ATV a that you drive around on the road because it's that kind of town. Exactly. Like that you just right, you right. need an alternative way to get around. And you can't get a Segway down there because Route 66 cut you off from the modernization of the world. But that's okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know about segways and all terrain. Seems like a bad combo. Yeah, to you're me. probably right about that. You're not going to get very far off the beaten path there did you enjoy your trip overall though bear you know the grand canyon is actually just fucking incredible i like genuinely that's one place you got to go see it because when you walk the path and then all of a sudden that grand vista is just taking over your entire field of view it's pretty remarkable so that is great arizona is kind of lame Apart from did, you get that, that. <laughs> did you get that feeling when you saw the huge sinkhole in the earth like i need to throw myself into that a Not little like in, bit in like a yeah bad way. Not like 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 a bad thing, but like just you see this thing and it's like I need to be drawn to this terrifying pit. It's one of those <laughs> intrusive thoughts, right? Where it's like, okay, so the, like what I would can't happen? It. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I worry that that's how I would think as well when I saw it. Dang, I really it was, want to see Grand Canyon though. It was it was pretty incredible though, honestly. Like it's it's a great thing to see. Uh, we got a docket today. We're going to talk about some stuff. The Kinect is no more. Microsoft has officially stopped manufacturing the device. And uh, we'll talk about the history of it. And I, I was telling these guys before the show, it's it's a little surreal to look on a Wikipedia page for something and see that is change into a was. That is just like mm. an official stamp yeah. of death right there. Was he was he was a bear. Mm hmm. True that. Uh, we got the mini SNES has uh, been out a few weeks now. And so it's about time we offer some impressions of it. We uh, managed to snag one in this household as well, at least kind of bought one from under my nose so that was that was a fun surprise to come <laughs> on to uh, and then uh we got a bunch of games to talk about on the docket today as well gold rush the game we'll hear all about that discovery channel experience from uh, ryan and nick uh nick and i also checked out the wild eight on square as our new co-op game in the show a couple of weeks ago so we'll talk about our impressions of that one I played Wunder Doctor, which is a neat little uh, mashup of Papers, Please, Little Inferno, and WarioWare kind of stuff uh, that made for a really positive oh. few-hour experience that I want to share with y'all real cool quick. cool mashup. Those it are is. weird genres to put together. And it worked really well, I thought. I'll tell you all about it. Uh, Air Memories of Old, another game Nick checked out these uh, past couple of weeks. Actually, oh, that's like brand new too, isn't it? Yeah, I didn't yeah, even realize that, was, that. I played it the day before it came out, actually. Nice. 
We'll talk about that as well. Uh, Opus Magnum, the new game from Zaktronics, creators of such gems as Inf uh, Infinifactory and Shen Shenjin IO. Shenjin IO, also, mm -hmm. also known. Also known as, how many ways can we reskin a programming game? <laughs> it's not even a reskin, Mathis. <laughs> I'm hearing good things about this one, especially the fact that it's a lot more approachable than the previous Actronics games, which I'm hoping does actually prove to be true. So we'll hear more about that That's today as well. Hold Mathis accountable for his crazy words. <laughs> <laughs> Triggered Ryan. It's, it's not a programming game. <laughs> I I believe you. It's a transmutation game. Get it right. It's You're building game. an alchemical okay. engine? <laughs> you make a list of commands. It's kind of programming, but... It's not programming. But it's not... Bears, look. it's good. <laughs> Actually, I really like the way, like, we got to save this for a second, but okay. I really like the way that this worked out because we're going to give you guys the opportunity to nerd out about that, and then immediately following it, Mathis will get the opportunity to nerd out about Cataclysm Yo, Dark Days Ahead. It's not a survival game, though. <laughs> it's a programming it's, game? It's, it's a programming game. <laughs> Opus Magnum Cataclysm is all made of freaking the at symbol. <laughs> oh, there's an enemy over there that's represented by a dollar sign. All right, first of all, I'll use a tile set. I'm not a freaking Neanderthal. It's called Opus Magnum because you got to have a huge dong to play it, Mathis. Nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I that's true. It. That's very true. <laughs> Speaking of huge dong, South Park the Fractured but Whole, also a member of the docket today. I don't know if that's actually good really segue. good. Well, I think I saw like one or two huge dongs in there. Uh, <laughs> Wolfenstein 2. <laughs> <laughs> not a lot of oh no yeah okay no that makes a lot more sense now okay that's good wolfenstein 2 also on the docket might be a brief appearance probably he might gonna revisit this one actually because i'm pretty sure i'll check it out myself as well so we'll maybe talk about that one next week too it's uh, good it's good that's wonderful awesome. all right yeah we heard all about it and then uh destiny 2 of course has made its way over to the pc as well so we'll talk about that and then somewhere in that mix i actually completely forgot to throw this in the uh uh, tab line up here, but we do have the Jackbox Party Pack 4, which was also released this past week, so we want to talk about the games found within as well. It's a lot of uh, a lot of good stuff, man. It's been a pretty big month here for gaming, so let's... Uh, yeah. broke to over. We're not even talking about Mario or Assassin's Creed that both came out today. Yeah. I haven't gotten Assassin's Creed or Mario yet. And so. I've heard both of them are fantastic. Mario is, like, getting the best reviews any game has ever gotten. Again. Six out of five. Yeah. Like, so we'll, we That's got... That's not even a real score. <laughs> we got a lot of stuff <laughs> to even talk about next week. So, yeah, it's looking pretty good. But uh, before we get into all that happiness and joy, let's talk about something horrible. The Microsoft Connect is no more. Microsoft Man, has they tried really something hard. horrible. Horrible, just <laughs> devastating. According to this article, I mean, geez, you would think that the Kinect is like saving lives every day, which it very give well might be. Choice, give us some choice quotes out of that article. Nick, hit me. You had a couple oh, that I knew you would. Yeah, wanted. I had a couple, but... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I if, said, there's one, lost them. if there's one thing that went wrong with Kinect as a market success, you might call it, quote, gamers, mm -hmm. for one. Mm -hmm. What's wrong uh, with y'all? Why didn't you just buy more connects, gamers? This is how it works. Corporations make things, and you like them. Yeah. That's how it works. If uh -huh. you didn't get it, now's the time. Very get easy to understand. It's a simple concept. In the years since, I don't believe it is an exaggeration to say that Connect has been the single most influential or at least prescient piece of hardware outside of the iPhone. Manufacturing on the Connect has shut down. Originally made for the 360. It sold 35 million units since its uh, debut in 2010, apparently. However, that was not enough to save the life of this uh, piece of software, which has now seen a lot more use outside of the gaming space, apparently. Uh, looking through this uh, big article that we had, this is an exclusive report from uh, Fast Co Design, which is honestly the first time I've ever heard of this website, but they got a pretty thorough report here, so kudos to them. Uh, they talk a lot, of the, though, about the fact that the Kinect has seen a lot more uh, use practically in uh, fields like, you know, med medical studies and scientific usage where the tracking of from the device and the voice recognition apparently was like ahead of its time back in 2010. So that's like the that's been the standard bearer for those industries for a while. I can agree that like in 2010, that kind of technology was kind of novel and, and interesting and, and not seen regularly, but it was also clearly still early. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in its development process. So while it may have been ahead of its time, it was also broken in like 17 different ways from Sunday. Like it was just a messed up 
not working properly. And while I'm sure it had a lot of useful and uh, interesting uses in the scientific and medical community, the only thing I ever saw it used for outside of video games was paranormal research. Mm. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> when they <laughs> when ghost hunters are like, do you see that? They've It's like it can track like the, the figure of the ghost sitting on the couch. I'm like, dude, that's oh. probably like dust and bad lighting. <laughs> I like, know what they love that. Did you ever see when they would turn it on with the grid and it would shoot a, a laser grid everywhere on a surface? That's probably 100% of what the paranormal research 100. is. 100%. Mm. Easily. That they needed that <laughs> shot of the grid on the wall so they could go, look, look at all the data points. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like the thing with the connect that uh, we can like celebrate its demise. The reason is not because the technology is bad. It's just right. because nobody wanted it after they saw what it did, at least for games. Like it, it can have practical applications in other fields and that's fine. But like, Whenever anybody was like, hey, we're making this video game and it has connect integration, you're like, yeah. okay, so it's it's got like a bad main menu or like it's it's just shoehorning essentially weird motion controls into a game that is probably worse as a result of it. So mm -hmm. like no they never came out with anything that made anybody a believer in the connect, I think, except maybe just dance and dance central. But yeah, that's you know, that's pretty much the only thing I can think of, like where the Connect would be would uh, was enjoyable in any way. Because playing any other game with the Connect, even if the controls worked a hundred percent with the Connect, not having feedback, like while you like kick a ball or whatever, that was not enjoyable to me. Just like swinging my foot in the air and being like, well, I'm not feeling like I'm kicking a ball, and it's kind of hard for like depth perception on the TV. And uh, I prefer pressing like a button and feeling the button or feeling the rumble of the controller See, that's instead of like, just waving my arms around. That's I think p part of the, the the core failure of this device is like that misunderstanding of why wouldn't gamers want to physically duck instead of pushing a button that ducks for them? Like that that you say that out loud and you're like, of course they would want to just be able to actually do the thing, but in reality, it's like no, the the push the button to do it is more responsive, easier, and what what we're used to. Like we're trying to fundamentally steer them away from what they've been bred to do their entire gamer lives and turn them into athletes, right? Which which is gonna, <laughs> sort of <laughs> gonna go great for the majority of us, but like it's. I, I think, like, this is obviously a, a, a take that's as cold as the depths of hell, but, like, it's just impossible, I feel, to make that sort of core change to the way the gamers approach the standard gaming experience. That's why, like, motion and dodging and ducking and stuff works really well with the Vive, though, because not only are you actively doing it, but you also have the controllers as well, mm. so you have... A little bit more feedback. tactile feedback as opposed yeah, you, to... Yeah, it helps, it helps immerse you. So, like, when you're playing, like, Space Pirates or whatever, you're dodging the bullets, but you also feel like you're holding guns. You know what I mean? Right. And your brain immediately clicks. It's like, oh, well, no, these are guns in my hands. In addition to the, the tactile feedback, I think having something in your peripheral that's actually related to the world you're supposed to be in is a big help, too. Yeah. Because if you're thinking about the Kinect, I mean, you're looking at a TV that's, like, three feet away... How immersed are you going to be in that? Mm -hmm. I, I'm acting as a proxy, like a puppet to something that's like a little postage stamp in my vision. Right. I, I find, I mean, it's not like it's a game breaker, but the concept itself was in the first place. Um, I, I always found it to be sort of a me too thing, just trying to cash in on the Wii. Yeah, it's, yeah. it was always I just was like. resentful of it right from the beginning. It was always trying to be the Wii killer. Like that was, that was. It was a, it was a marketing obvious. driven idea that they wanted people to like because it was convenient for them, not because it was a good idea. And like Ryan said too, like they never, and the article mentions this as well. There was never a big like Connect based franchise. There was never a Call of Duty for the Connect. There was never really that big driving force. And a part of that too was the fact that they weren't able to dedicate all the resources of the console to those sorts of projects. Like if you wanted to make a connect dedicated game back in that day you had to take a, or take account of the fact that the connect itself would use a lot of the processing power and the ram available from the console itself so like you had to be handicapped from the start if that was the route you wanted to take which you know was probably not all that enticing for folks who knew it was going to be a gamble to begin with 
It was really it's just funny to me. They, they spent $500 million marketing the damn thing. They could have just put that towards a game and maybe actually gotten somebody interested in it. Well, then nobody would care about it though. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's a double edged sword. I don't know. Word of mouth, I think would be more powerful, but yeah, it's a kind of a catch 22. Yeah. But Milo, like the, Milo would have saved it. The, the <laughs> thing is like, I, I don't know if I, I think it's kind of promoting a false narrative to suggest that like, if they had more processing power, the connect could have been good. Cause like, I just, I, I'm not a believer in, and this extends it like hits the border of my opinion right at VR. I think the jury's out on VR. Yeah. But I've never really played a game apart from like Wii Sports where I was like motion controls of any sort added anything to this experience. Mm. And that that came out like day one of console motion controls, more or less. Yeah. So oh six or something. Dude, yeah. The iToy did it just as well as the Kinect did. Just they took it more seriously on the 360. That's all. The thing is, like, in video games, most of, at least in our traditional model of them, in most of them you do cool shit that we as human beings can't do one-to-one. Like, it, it just doesn't make sense if you're playing, like, you know, a dead space to have all the controls mapped to actions and gestures that you're actually doing in the real world instead of just having it on a controller. Yeah. So, like, it, I, I could imagine, and admittedly, maybe I'm kind of, like, closed-minded about this, I could imagine, like, good puzzle games that you could make you by using the connect and allowing you to like manipulate things in your environment with gestures and stuff like that. But in terms of like really like frenetic action games or anything like that, it just seems like it's going to be way more efficient to do it on a controller. What is that VR puzzle game that I'm thinking of that you enjoyed that was going to be a perfect example there? Fantastic Contraption. Yeah, that's the one. Fantastic yeah, Contraption. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah. Stuff like that is, you know, but I, I feel like, I, we can't even fathom the thing that's really going to be able to sell this uh, form of play, Wh- whether it be the Connect version, which I mean, I guess it's not going to be the Connect version anymore, but the uh, the VR game that is going to make waves. I don't think is anything that we're even like on board with right now. We don't really have an understanding of what that sort of experience is going to be. That's going to captivate people. I think it'll happen. I think eventually, like, that's just going to be the direction it has to go because how much further can we go with just, like, these standard experiences? I I don't don't know. Like, looking 10, 15 years down the road, is it just going to keep getting prettier? But I don't know. We'll see. That's maybe a bit too grand of a speculation. Yeah. It's tough. Yeah. I don't know. I think think people look in the wrong spot. And that's, again, it's coming from a layperson's perspective. Mm. But I think games, you know, using a keyboard and mouse can continue to get better. I, I, think, I think you know there's there's space creatively to make things that are different different and then from an engineering standpoint as you know we get more power there's things that you can do that you couldn't conceive of doing before mm-hmm. as think, you, and like, this is a little diff, like old now but like as everybody gets the land or not landline sorry as everybody gets broadband obviously mm-hmm. and as like internet rates go up and up like you can do massively multiplayer stuff you couldn't do before but yeah, yeah. like I I I don't think it's the gimmicky stuff for the most part, which is why, again, I'm, I'm like stopping short of saying that VR fits into this category. In 10 years, we'll probably know whether it did or it didn't. Yeah. But it's, it's too early to tell we'll right have now. The perspective we have the Kinect now on VR in 2027, which is, you know, what I'm looking I forward to. And I hope exactly. it's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I think like AI, that kind of thing is going to see big leaps over the next like 10 years. Yeah, that's where true AI too. is going to be, and then it make open world games more believable and that kind of thing. I think we're going to see huge leaps and bounds in skyboxes over the next 10 years. Destiny is going to be fading away in skybox technology. I'm like half kidding. I think that's like good? we're putting a lot of money. <laughs> Is it no longer just a couple of JPEGs stacked on top of one another? No, the, the skyboxes in Destiny 2 might be the prettiest things that I've seen in gaming. That's like, awesome. They're just fucking beautiful. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, that doesn't carry a game, obviously, but they're really pretty. Mm. It makes you stop and look at them. So, you know, props, mm-hmm. I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, as far as the Kinect sensor goes, it is still being utilized, the, the sensor itself, and the, you know, the technology is not just going to be thrown in the garbage. Uh, they have the HoloLens that st- they're still working on, Microsoft, and uh, apparently the V5 version of the uh, Kinect, which uses only 1.5 watts of power compared to the 50 watts that the original version of the Kinect used, uh, is going to be utilized within the HoloLens. So apparently that's all just sort of coming together. All those teams are going to be working on that stuff. Uh, so for the 0.01% of you out there who are engineers working in this capacity, <laughs> like do with that information what you will. <laughs> 
Has anyone Big... seen anything on Hololens in the last year? That's what I'm wondering. Yeah, I, I, like I, I hope that that is you know indicative of hopefully mm. like a, a, a streamlined and a quicker development process for the Hololens potentially, so we can see more about that in the near future. But last I saw, it was a table that had Minecraft blocks yeah, on. Yeah, that's what I last saw too. And that was it. What was that? That was like what <laughs> E3? E3 two years ago, mm -hmm. maybe. Yeah, I think 2015, maybe. Yeah. All right, cool. Well, there we go. Connect News is all gone. The other thing is that it's been dead forever. Like, it was dead when it launched. At least for <laughs> Xbox <laughs> One. Dead before it launched. Yeah, and every, just pushed it anyway. Pretty much everybody was like, this is not going to work. And that was like, I don't know, maybe and then Microsoft's eight like, Here's or nine years ago. <laughs> yeah, and then Microsoft the Xbox One came out. Down your throat. They're like, you have to have the Kinect. And everyone was like, please, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually, every time the Kinect actually does something, I'm surprised. And yeah. all it does is, like, Caden, I'll be sitting on the couch, like, watching Netflix for an hour. If she stands up, it'll go, hi, Kate. Like, you've been signed in. Mm. And I'm like, oh, fantastic. <laughs> If you stand in front of your TV, it will sign you into the profile that matches your body shape. Why don't you just I thought you said it, it didn't even do that properly once. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> Again, it, like, it, it, it doesn't good. recognize a sitting model. for what, it would, I imagine it's difficult. The body silhouette between you and Kate could not be much more different. I'm aware, yeah. So I wonder Some, how all those it freaking trick it paranormal, <laughs> paranormal investigators, like, if it doesn't detect a living body normally, how the fuck do you think it detects a ghost? Well, that's what it's good at. <laughs> that's what it was built for. <laughs> it's just, it's mysterious technology, right? You just go, oh, this is like a, a sensor, and it, it yeah. maps things that, that are close like, and far away. Dude, this, this sounds like the worst sci-fi plot of all time. It's like scientists work to develop the ultimate motion capturing device, but it turns out it actually captures ghosts. So oh! Paranormal connectivity. Oh, it's so good. Perfect. I love Alrighty. it. Here's my, and I know we're like getting off this topic. Yeah. Never have I looked at the keyboard on my PC and been like, I wish this was better. Like, Same. it's just, yeah. it's been around for like 30 years and it's just really, really great at what it does. In fact, the more buttons it gets, the more I go, I don't want this. You already got <laughs> it pretty much perfect. You see those people I, with like the additional 16 buttons on yeah. the side of the thing, and you're like, why? I don't no, need I think there's Windows one Media Player controls. I think you could have F keys that are like the stream deck that are LEDs mm, and you sure, could change yeah. the F keys to look like other stuff and use them for other hotkeys functions. That could be maybe the only improvement I'd ask for. But you don't want motion capture in it? No. You don't want a motion capture <laughs> keyboard? Are you sure? I don't want motion anything. What really, if we force you to VR. have the motion capture keyboard every time you get a PC? What would that even mean? Well, people are like, <laughs> what if you could replace the keyboard with like a heads up display keyboard that you could type on? I think that's actually like a lot worse. At least my imagination yeah, of it. Yeah, the reason people get mechanical keyboards is because they like that tactile feedback. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I don't want to type on my iPad on a... is awful. Yeah, you I don't want to type like this. On... Like this doesn't feel right. <laughs> <laughs> Do it on your desk too. It's like a very Wait. foreign feeling. I got used to my phone, but when I use the iPad to type, it's the weirdest config. Yeah. I'm like doing Spider-Man hands on it. It's <laughs> awful. But they sell tactile keyboards for them. I just don't want to spend $100 on one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me talk a little bit about the mini SNES. About a, a month ago, and we've had uh, since ample time to be, uh, be participants in its revolution. As, uh, it's everyone a neat toy takes their nostalgia wave and just rides it into oblivion. Hey, uh, Mathis, hey. what do you think about your mini SNES so far? It's a neat toy. It's a neat it's a, toy. <clears throat> it's a nostalgia box. Mm -hmm. And uh, I knew that's what it was going to be when I got it. And it does exactly that. Booting that thing up. Um, it's really, I love the main menu. Uh, I think the music on it and like the animations. And if you leave it alone for an, like about a minute, Mario comes on screen. He picks a game randomly for you. And like that kind of stuff's neat. Mm -hmm. um, but when you boot a game up and you put like the CRT Weird. filter on, it's just, it brings me back to being like nine years old again. Yeah. And that's, that's what I wanted. And it was really fun. I played a bunch of uh, Super Mario World, you know, for the 90th time and probably in the past like five years uh, with the CRT filter on, which was great. Super Metroid with CRT filter is great. It's an emulator. And yeah. that's that's really what it is. And if you are like, you know, it's an emulator, screw it. I don't I have it on my computer, then it's not for you. But if you know, you grew up with the SNES well, me... and the Genesis and, and that kind of thing, having like an a Nintendo made SNES controller in your hands brand new again, for me was like a little magical just because it's what I grew up with. And yeah. I, I, I like that. 
I, I want to jump in on that emulator conversation because I like I, I recognize that that was what we uh, harped on quite a bit when we were talking about this, uh, whether it be the initial announcement or even when it came out. Like, if you just want to play these games, you had that option for years. You didn't have to wait for Nintendo to be able to actually do this, right? Right. But I, I do feel that this is actually like it's it's justifiable to pick this up even if you are considering that route just because Nintendo has actually done a great job, I feel, of... Uh, packaging this all together like i think the the save states the way they handled that is just really smooth like it's 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 extremely easy to be playing a game decide i don't really want to play this anymore i'm going to switch over to castlevania or something so you just hit the reset button you immediately like within three seconds you can reset the console create a save state exactly where you were go to the new game boot it up and then you're playing that game like literally within three seconds you can do all that stuff and it's it's insanely quick and easy to navigate everything everything's very straightforward like the creation of save states alone can be kind of a complicated thing if you don't really understand what you're doing with emulators but nintendo has distilled it into its simplest form for like everybody to be able to understand so it's, it's not a that pretty... hard you press f1 usually well yeah but like <laughs> I, I shouldn't say the actual creation of save states more like the like downloading of emulators and actually like using that no, stuff yeah, i suppose that's yeah fair. Not like, yeah, you're right. It's just pushing it's actually, a button. But. The one thing you said is actually my one. I have like two tiny nitpicks that are just like whatever nitpicks. Mm-hmm. It's the fact that to get to the main menu, you have to hit the reset button every time. And if you're mm-hmm. sitting on a couch and it's you know a little further away, that's kind of annoying to constantly get up, hit reset, get back. And while the controller wires are longer than the NES mini controller wires, they're still, still short. They're still too short. Yeah, They need to be like three feet longer than they, than they are. And they sell the not... extensions because they can, and it's yeah. like an obvious cash grab. Like, I wish they just make them sh- longer. That's I too thought the short. reasoning was in Japan, they have it as a tradition that you sit in front of your TV, so they wanted to give that gift to the citizens of America by forcing you to put the thing on the floor and sit in front of your TV. I know okay. it sounds like okay. that's, <laughs> that's the explanation that I heard for why they're so short. That's that's not a good explanation, but okay. I know. <laughs> uh, it's almost like America and Japan is different. Yeah, weird. <laughs> you know, I also uh, this was a kind of a fun opportunity for me to actually uh, experience this side of the '90s. You know, because I was a I was a Sega PS1 boy, so I never really experienced all these uh, SNES classics. So I played things like Secret of Mana for the first time. I checked out Contra Three which was way too hard, and I finally understand what people are talking about when they talk about fucking Contra. Because that game is insane! It's so impossible! Oh, the SNES one, I think, is considered the hardest one, though. No. Really? Was, Alien Wars or whatever it is? No. The one that's on the Look, let me put it this way. I've beaten Alien Wars. No code. You beat Alien like Wars? like 20 times. Yeah, there's only like six levels, you know? Okay. You got... You got side scrolling level, then you go top down, and you fight a weird old turtle, and you got sweet level where you're climbing a ladder, and then you got another top down level that sucks the big one, and then you're fighting a big old alien boy. Mm. Contra one is hell. Uh, <laughs> Super C, which is the second one, is pretty easy. And then I hear that like Shattered Soldier is really difficult, the PS2 I'm, one. Yeah. Yeah, I played it. Mm. Uh, anyway, I had yeah. no using the Konami code for the Contra games. I thought they were balanced badly. It didn't even yeah. occur to me to use the Konami code. Which yeah, is it's got to work. It's just a ROM. Yeah. Uh, also, if you have just played Secret of Mana for the first time, they are redoing it and releasing it in either January or February uh, with a completely reskinned, uh, you know, fancy new graphical bit of polish on it. Yeah, so. yeah. Nice. One of my favorite RPGs ever, actually. So very excited to see that. I hope they don't ruin it too much because I don't really like the art style, but we'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Bodes well. It's going to be on Steam, too, so that's something. Nice. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I did some a uh, little bit of... What else did I play? I think I, I did check out a little bit of Castlevania as well, which is, you know, it's great. Mega Man X, great. Uh, just, yeah, it was cool. Uh, it's a great I, lineup. Yeah, it's it's solid. I was I was pleased, but yeah, those little couple of gripes are definitely valid, but it's not a bad little toy. I agree with you, man. So there we yep, go. It's it's a great little nostalgia thing. I, haven't, mm-hmm. I didn't play Star Fox 2. I uh, don't. Have I. I didn't even play Star Fox one because I don't know how I could handle playing that game at like ten frames per second. Right, and uh, here's the here's the other thing. I will say this: this immediately made me realize that wow, games have gotten a lot better. Like <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. leaps and bounds. <laughs> that was nice. 
there's a handful of them that still hold up under like the modernized ideas of accessibility on the SNES. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're right. Most of them are just weirdly balanced or too difficult or obtuse. And like, uh, I think Link to the Past still holds up pretty well, though. Yeah, for sure. All right. There we go. Some mini SNES. Uh, it's time to hear about Gold Rush, the game. I've, yeah. I've got so many questions, but I think most of them will just be answered. All right. So, uh, so they made a Discovery Channel Gold Rush, you know, the reality TV show that follows the series of miners in Alaska trying to strike it rich. Mm -hmm. with, you know, the old gold claims that they got in their, their ancient lineage of gold mining family, and they learned everything, and then they want to apply it, and it's, uh, it's a dream come true for me, actually. <laughs> so, <laughs> they made a simulatory game. Uh, out of that concept where you are a prospector moved to Alaska, you got like $250 in your pocket and a shitty pickup truck. And you're going to take that and turn it into a gold fortune. And it, on the surface, that concept sounds fantastic. The game that they ended up producing, and I believe it was kickstarted, you know, it's pretty freaking janky to be perfectly honest. And uh, Brian had a much harder time with it than I think I did. Uh, if you got to have some patience and I think you got to have a little bit of passion for the subject material. And I happen to have those things, oddly enough. Mm -hmm. uh, I've never talked about this outside of this one very isolated situation, but I've I very much romanticized the idea of being a, a gold miner. Really? And I think there's something very cool about that lifestyle. Do um, you watch the show? I did. I watched a lot of the show, actually. Mm. And it, it sort of put that into me that I'm like, man, this I in another life, I would not have a problem with living that <laughs> lifestyle. Um, so it was kind of neat to be able to dabble in some surprisingly technical uh, situations building wash plants and panning for gold and all all of the stuff that's like way more simulatory than you would expect is in the game um, mm -hmm. and it's still being improved and added upon and it's again really buggy and by most accounts quite bad but if you really enjoy that subject material it's like the best game in town for that it's maybe the only one mm -hmm. uh, and it's like 3D sandbox. You go and you get materials. You put them in the back of your truck, like literally put it in the back of your truck, and it bounces around because the physics are really janky, and then it usually falls out. Um, okay. Then you cart it off to your claim. You set it up. You got to, like, actually put it in in the way that it would need to be put in in real life. So, like, if you're building a wash plant, you got to put it in the right order. You got to get the buckets for the right place. You got to run the extension cords. You got to run the pumps. You got to run the hydraulics. Like, all of this shit is actually in the game. Mm -hmm. um, and I got to stage two of three, which you start out as a, a tiny little, uh, you're just a panner, and then you work up to a, a small wash plant, and then you get to the big wash plant, and uh, you get bigger and bigger construction equipment. I have an excavator right now with the, you know, the, the brontosaurus looking thing with the scoop at the yeah, end. Yeah, yeah. And I'm just digging up dirt and feeding it into the top of my thing. It's sorting it out. It's got riffles. It's vibrating. I got, a, <laughs> I got all of this stuff. It's great. <laughs> So you, you work at it for a while, you produce a little amount of gold, you go, yeah, I did the thing, and then mm -hmm. you do it again. And it's actually just mostly all grinding to try and make enough money to buy the next level of equipment to make slightly more gold out of however much you want to. So do you um, ever, you, you're building a gold empire, right? So you ever, like, kind of. starting to hire other people to do the dirty work for you? Or is that, that really... Is, evidently, that is in the game, but it is not modeled accurately enough to most people's satisfaction. So you can hire other employees, but I don't know what they do. They may be just represented abstractly as like a monetary exchange. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they might just streamline some process. I haven't actually hired anyone yet, but that is like the next step for what I'm about to do. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, but that is in the game. They're also adding a an auger. So you're going to be able to do core samples in your claims and check the different spaces for what concentration uh, of gold ore is in that soil, which I thought that's like the main thing you need to have in the game. If you're going to prospect, the point is to find proliferation of gold in the soil. Yeah. And if you can't do that, it's just scripted. And that is unfortunately what they went with for the first wash plant. I love how familiar with the jargon you are, man. You are so on top of this. It's awesome. I, I could be better, actually. I just haven't watched it in a couple of years, but like I was pretty into it. I was mm -hmm. like, this could be a thing for me. Like if I lost everything, my house burned down, I could move to Alaska. I might be happy doing this. <laughs> Especially so, now you got the training yeah, for it. You got to keep in mind that it's a bad game, but I really like it for <laughs> stupid reasons. Okay. So let yeah. me, let me hear Ryan's opinion. <laughs> on it, Ryan's let me like like transition the perfectly there. Time. <laughs> I want to preface this by saying you can like it and that's fine, but it actually is garbage <laughs> and that's okay. 
Like, it, it, the things that make it garbage don't necessarily make the game bad. It's just very, very, very poorly made to get to the... It's like its own metaphor. It's like maybe there's a nugget of gold, but it's surrounded by tons of dirt. <laughs> <laughs> so you've metaphorically speaking, you've gone through the trouble of getting the, you know, the mats and the hog pan and the now you're all the way up to the excavator and you can get to that gold easily. But for someone who's like, I don't even know if there's gold inside of there. I went so many times I went through this game. I'm like, oh, that was a bold decision to not make any kind of in-game tutorial except for, oh, by the way, we put silent video tutorials yeah, man yeah Dick we've got tutorial. we've got silent video tutorials in your journal it's where you can YouTube. watch Call somebody play the game in 140p <laughs> all they needed to do like the the thing that it, it made me so annoyed was that they just kind of seemed to operate under the assumption that hey you've seen the show so you know the steps <laughs> yeah. to mine gold you just put your hog pan over here what's a hog pan you know, you put the mats in the hog pan. You dig up dirt, but not that dirt. You got to go get the dirt from this place over here. Then you walk it on your shovel over to the thing, and you pour it in, and then you pour a big bucket of water on top of it, and then you go take the mats. You wring the mats out in the bucket, and then you get your little gold pan, and you go shook, 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 and then you get tweezers. You take a, literally the first piece of gold like I was like point zero zero five ounces and that's okay you get that's, better over time that's like two dollars so i you know like for eight hours of in-game <laughs> labor that's fine but the, they just make they almost seem to wear it as like a point of pride that it's like i mean you, i know you bought a game like your intention is that at some point you're gonna have fun with this you're gonna have some enjoyment we're not gonna streamline that at all we just had Tommy, the intern, record himself playing it and then categorize those as videos inside of the actual game itself. Dig 2. Well, in, in Dig 2. Thank you. I think it is useful to note, at least, though, that this is a very small development team and they're making a very niche product. This is not for everybody, and I'm actually surprised you even played it at all because if I had this little interest in the concept, I probably wouldn't have even bothered with it. Um, but I think knowing a little bit about this concept is actually kind of necessary external to the product itself, which so, is unfortunate, I mean, and it's it's bad. It's a bad thing to do. I mean, I, as far as I'm concerned, all I had to do is be like, hey, it looks like it's your first day on the job. Here's the, like, four steps that you go through to get gold. Well, they do show you. Like, when you bring the stuff to the place, you put it, and there's, like, a line that there you There is an outline, with. but they don't they don't give you the steps to actually solve it. That's where you go. They do the in the journal. Time. Okay, well, I had to go to chat, and chat was like, yeah. you idiot. You get the, you fill the bucket up with water, not that water, and then you pour the water over the hog pan. No, it no, soaks I the mats. Too. It's like all they really – again, the game is actually – and I don't know why, and I, I'm not blaming you for this at all. People who like this game have a chip on their shoulder that just annoys the shit out of me, where they're like, well, you're just – you're too. You got to have a little patience. You're just too stupid to enjoy Gold Rush. It's not – the players were yeah, Are you really getting much pushback here? Your chat was exclusively no, no, no. calling trash. And not true. <laughs> Literally no. not true. People are, like, they're so in this genre against the idea of stream, like, onboarding people. They literally they think the, the learning curve should be a wall. You either bounce off it or you just, like, you break through it. And then you're, you're in. You're a little elitist about it? I, I think so, but we're getting a little too far, hmm. perhaps, in, like, the metaverse surrounding the game. Regardless, my biggest problem with the game is only played like an hour is that they just do n the onboarding is garbage. They have no streamlined tutorial that makes it conceivable for you to play easily if you don't have a foundation in it. If you play Euro Truck Simulator, American Truck Simulator, I think those are games that admittedly are a little bit easier to understand what you're doing because you're basically just driving or you're hauling goods from point A to point B and then parking. But they do a pretty good job of being like, hey, you might not know what a friggin chevy h1900 16 wheeler turbo cab is so we're gonna like tell you in mm -hmm. gold rush they're just like go buy a hog pan no mats and you, i don't know what it it sounds like something i no used pump. to render no pump <laughs> that's right a hog pan no pump. you needed some miners moss you needed two you can get an extension and get up to four but at the start you only get two duh idiot <laughs> and also like apparently it gets better uh, once you get past the first couple of hours, but the loop of the first hour was pretty much like fill a bucket, 
pour the bucket onto this conveyor belt and then go yeah. as ship as Welcome to Gold Prospect and in Alaska, like, baby. That is what that activity consists of IRL, though. Pretty much. Yeah, but that, that doesn't mean it's a. It's, this is on Steam powered, not you know Udemy.com. Well, learn like, to if pan that for doesn't gold. sound fun <laughs> to you to do at all, why do it? <laughs> because I, I, being a truck driver doesn't sound fun to me at all. But American all right. Truck Simulator like brought it to that level. Yeah, That's they why don't I, do I mean, any favors. Clearly, I get you. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing. It's the exact same reason I washed out of Car Mechanic Simulator 2017. Is like I, I want to like. I kind of enjoy the abstraction of like solving this puzzle. I don't want to be a mechanic because I'm yeah. a little, I'm not like, a, I'm a disgrace to, you know, my gender, you know, as opposed <laughs> to my grandparents' generation. Dude, so I'm, I'm with you. It took me like six hours to change a car battery once because I was like, yeah, I don't I'm, understand. <laughs> so, like, I, when I was playing Car Mechanic Simulator, it was just like, hey, go put some lug nuts into the, you know, turbo chassis. And I was like, don't know what that means. So I walked around for 20 minutes and then just alt F forward. Cause it's, it, <laughs> if you're not going to make the effort to like, I get that you're making a niche product. You got to extend an olive branch though. That's what I mean. Like you're, if, if you want your game to only be sold to people who are already familiar with the source material, then that's fine. Yeah. But I think that there are simulators and it's been proven in the past that can like get people who are not like, the what was i think it's literally just called train simulator train simulator popped off for a while because of the fact that it's a little bit more accessible than other simulators same with american truck simulator and euro truck simulator when the developers are just like ah yeah if you want to know how to play it's in the glossary it's like well if you're not going to put in the effort why am i putting in the effort i really do think that they just didn't have the budget or the scope in mind to do what you wanted them to do like, they just didn't have it together, unfortunately. It's just not a polished product at all. Right, well, you, we agree 100% on that. Yeah. <laughs> and it's just how much are you willing to put up with it being this janky to get what you want out of it? And I'm willing to put up with a lot, I guess. I don't want to derive too much from this, but they did receive 12 times their asking price for their Kickstarter. So I don't know if the budget was, was their as asking big of an price issue. like $12. It was like 10000 So it's not a huge budget still. Like comparatively speaking, budget. of course, that's not that big. But at the same time, it's it, like they are the publishing arm for like one of the largest cable networks in America. Oh, they clearly don't give a shit, though. They didn't help much. Oh, yeah. But if they don't give a shit. Why do I give a shit? Well, don't, <laughs> That's a don't fair have question. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. It did though, I, from what I'm hearing, I haven't touched the game, but I have touched the, the truck driver simulator games. The thing that the simu- the truck driver simulator games that these other games don't do is they give you like three options of simulation. You can play it like an arcade game. You can play it semi-realistic with having like, you know, somewhat have to manage like actual driving or you go super hardcore sim in like euro truck and american truck driver have to manage everything Mm -hmm. and that level of just being able to like i'm just here to have like a good time and relax and play casual that sounds like it's needed in those style of games where like i like the idea of panning for gold but i don't want to go through the 70 step process of actually panning for gold i want to go through like four steps and that's it no they definitely took a like a very close to simulatory approach to this as opposed to the arcadey approach and I, I actually like that, but I also completely grant that there are s- situations where I could hate it too. Um, and they're actually planning to add seasons to this, which is a huge deal for the idea of gold mining. Because in Alaska, when winter comes around, no more gold mining. So you get your time up until winter starts and you got to stop at that point. And that is actually a thing that although I appreciate they would add it, it actually makes a huge difference to the game that they would add it. Mm-hmm. I also might be frustrated by that. So you yeah, have to like, do, sit there and wait. What are you going to do in the wintertime? No, I'm pretty sure that's your, the end of your season. You cash out. So that's like putting a time limit on each year. Right now, it's just day-night cycle, day-night cycle, day-night cycle. Sometimes it rains, and that's it. During but it the adds winter. a whole new layer, like a meta game to it, that you then have to worry about You know, managing your employees, managing your expenses, uh, keeping your supplies up and all of that business. It's not in the game right now. But if they add it, could be cool, could wreck it. I don't know yet. Mm-hmm. Well, like the game, it, it's almost like the game might be fine. And it all, is also, I'll like be the first to admit, or the second to admit, it's an extremely niche product. So it's possible even if I got to the nugget of gold, I would be like, I don't really like it. But I, I just don't know because they're polishing the gold and making it too hard to crack through the dirt is my perspective. Mm-hmm. I, maybe, and if their mission statement is that we're just going to make like the most simulatory gold rush thing of all time. That's fine. I, I don't know if they've succeeded because you haven't done the first part, which is let's make the first hour like a little gentler instead of I, I 
Like it just seems like they almost don't want people to play it unless they're already into the source material. During the winter, you should have the option of leaving Alaska for Hawaii for four months for uh, spending your gold on Mai Tais and Surf Lessons. <laughs> I think that's ultimately what people are looking for out of this experience. Did you know, Ryan, that the car battery actually drains if you leave the lights on too long? I had a feeling. I was actually, at that, by that point, I was kind of like, it'd be sick if that just ran out and I had an excuse to quit. It also, <laughs> it also eats gas. The car will actually eat gas and the needles inside of the actual dashboard really work. That's like a serious degree of dedication hey, to model that. It is maybe, but like, okay. I just, I'm, impressed by the, <laughs> I'm impressed by the things they cared to do versus the things they didn't. Sure, I just yeah, I mean, like I'm I, so impressed would be one word, surprised might be another. It, <laughs> yeah. Like, it, you know what, it, it, this game, and now let's just get into abject racism. This game seems like extremely German to me. And all, a lot of these simulators it's, are German. Uh, Polish. <laughs> what? Okay, there, there's, there's so many of these games. For whatever reason, these simulators are predominantly made in Eastern Europe or Germany. And I think they, it is just like a different sort of methodology that goes on for the players. That they're like, I really want to drive a bus in the city. I will read the manual and I'll learn all about this bus and then I'll drive the bus in the city. Whereas I'm over here like, I'm a dumb North American. Can you please illuminate the button on the screen that I'm supposed to press the first <laughs> time that I need to press it so that I can internalize so that. So I can confirm my mouse works. Exactly. <laughs> Some, right. Something in between, <laughs> use the scroll wheel to move the camera and then the alternative, which is just like, hey, we put silent tutorials in the game that are 90 seconds long each. I don't even want to watch video tutorials for things that I want to learn in the first place. I, if I say, hey guys, this is, you know, J script tube 101. I'm like, no, I don't need this. Just this give, is, me the, give me the text. This is establishing a very interesting precedent for the Opus Magnum conversation too. I really, I got to wonder where oh, you're going to no, no, go. Opus Magnum <laughs> starts with like a half hour long tutorial. Well, okay, there we go. For the first couple of puzzles, they're just like, just drag this here. All right, we'll talk about that in a bit, though. Let me let me let me steer us off Gold Rush. We spent way longer on this yeah, than I well, ever thought we would. Wrapping up, I just want to say I don't recommend it generally, mm -hmm. but if you love the show and you love that concept, this is the best shot you got at a decent game of it. Well, there you you go. might still hate it though, even if you love that concept. And I don't think Ryan should ever play it again. <laughs> I would love to love the game. Yeah. But you don't, and that's okay. That's all right. But I, I don't, I didn't have a chance because it was literally like, <laughs> just give me a chance to. Love it was you. the most angry I think I've ever seen you be at a video game. <laughs> I've, I've been angrier at other video. You games, were but... thrashing the camera around, throwing things. So, so for the other thing that, because it, people are going like, they are being really unfair. Other things that happened to me, uh, dug a little hole in the ground, player got stuck. Had to mash the jump button for like thirty five oh, seconds that, yeah. until eventually yeah. I hit the magic pixel. Super button. janky. Don't Carrying disagree. a bucket around, I turned. It got wedged with the uh, collider attached to a fence post and just got stuck there. Tried to click on it, can't click on it. It's Very stuck janky. there. What yeah. do you do? You take the flashlight and then swing it, and then you knock it a little <laughs> bit off the fence post. So, like, the, the, like, I just, it is, and you admitted this, and I appreciate it. It's a bad product. The game, <laughs> it's extremely unpolished. The game might be okay once you get into that. All right. We can leave it there. I'll take what I can get. Let's move on. <laughs> Cold Rush the Games. $20 <laughs> came out October 13th. It's available now on Steam. Uh, Nick, tell me a little bit about The Wild 8, please. The Wild 8 is a top-down survival game that feels a little bit like uh, a zombified version of uh, the... Dark, what the hell is it called? Long, long Dark. dark. Yeah. Long Dark, thank you. Yeah. Like a top-down version, low-poly version of Long Dark with a polygon, low-poly aesthetic, where you explore, you try and survive, you eat the wilderness, you build shelters, and little by little, uh, it exposes a more sinister undertone of a world gone wrong, uh, that some sort of nuclear holocaust or something has happened, and there's like demonic werewolves and mutants that you really don't expect. Mm -hmm. I thought this was going to be like a straight up nature survival game, but actually there's like bunkers and wild shit going on. Um, and it's got four player co-op and it's got a really big map and it's also brutally hard. Yeah. Uh, I, we had like, like a mixed kind of bag game. of an experience in the three hours we played of it. We started in the wrong game mode, uh, clearly the wrong game mode. It yeah, was way yeah. too hard there. 
uh, and we had to switch over out of survival to like a sandbox, more freeform mode. Do you remember the names of the modes, Bear? I think it was Exploration is the easier one that we ended up going with, and then probably Survival right. is the name of the uh, first one, yeah. which was definitely a survival mode. Like, it was impossibly difficult, I feel, especially... Well, to be fair, like, we jumped into it with, like, basically sight unseen, kind of just trying to learn it as we went, and that is not the way to play the survival yeah. mode, obviously. That's like know medium that now. plus expert mode after you've sur surmounted every challenge in the regular mode. Right. Um, and this is still in early access, yeah? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm looking so at the reason I actually haven't touched this game. I remember looking at it multiple times and be like, this looks something like cool. Yeah, because it the came reviews... out originally in like February, I believe. Yeah, and it keeps getting updates and, and stuff. And then, But the reviews have gone from like when it came out good to recently like bad and mixed. And, it, and there's things mm -hmm. just like, this is unplayable. It's too hard. The art style is great, but every single area of the game is unpolished. And I'm like, ooh, well, maybe I'll wait. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can't speak exactly to the level of polish for everything, because like Nick said, we really didn't get as far as we thought we would in the first few hours. Uh, but it does work, which is a step above pretty much every other group survival oh. and exploration game that's available right it now. It crashed like four times while we played it. We kept getting kicked out of it, remember? Oh, we yeah. Were, well, like we for everybody, I think it crashed twice, and I think like one or two people crashed once or twice as well. But yeah, that's... So it's not perfect, and it's in early access as well. But it, it like it has functioning lobby systems, and you can play with your friends pretty reliably, which yeah. is still unfortunately like a, a step above most. Eight, eight people, mm -hmm. hence the name, yeah. which is a lot of people for a survival game. And we can't speak again to uh, how uh, successfully you can do that with eight people, but with four people, it was fairly fairly reliable, fairly sturdy. Uh, Gameplay-wise, it's very similar to a lot of these survival games as well. Uh, the real difference maker was uh, at that point that Nick mentioned where like things started to get really interesting with the zombie mobs and all these different areas that we could explore. We eventually found this bunker that was uh, going to act as our new base of operations, which provided us with all these different uh, resources and tools that we could use. So it... it feels like there's uh, a lot going on, at least uh, right now, and it feels like the, the map is expansive and actually filled with interesting things to go check out. So there's, there's you know, some, some appeal to it at the moment. Apparently also with the most recent update uh, that we were playing on, I think it's point seven. I want to say, uh, it introduces animal husbandry and animal, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Breeding, I suppose. Uh, where Farming, you, yeah, yeah, something like that, where you can actually, you know, like utilize wolves and uh, I think maybe even deer to your advantage in various ways. So, uh, yeah, it's got it's got some interesting systems in play, but there are some issues. Like it, it's still a pretty run of the mill survival game. It's a it's a tree puncher, you know. Like you're you're gonna have to go through the motions of getting wood and then co collecting berries and stuff like that, especially if you're playing in the survival mode, like we mentioned, like you're going to have to spend a lot of time getting food because you just, you starve after like six hours, it seems in yes. game. Like it's, it's insane how quickly your bars will deplete when you're playing in that mode. But that sounds uh, actually awful. It's, we never found a way to move our homestead officially to the bunker, right? Yeah, we were always no. respawning at the origin point, which is weird. There very well may be a way to do it, but yeah, you you're right. We never really figured out. Is there how. like a like a bedroll or something that you can sleep on yeah. that would set you have your no, there is settlement? didn't do anything. <laughs> okay, or like what was it called? Your encampment, I think, is the thing that you could put down and then you could pick it back up and move it around with you. But that wouldn't actually change where you spawn when yeah, you were it killed. Didn't That's weird. actually matter yeah. at all. Yeah, uh, it was very sure. frustrating because we had to keep doing a suicide run back to the bunker every time we would die and respawn. Mm -hmm. It's like what? Okay, why do we have a bedroll then? Uh, yeah, <laughs> and. I'm I'm trying to think like I I don't really consider this the the best survival game out right now. Like I'm, I'm I I don't think it's worth putting on a pillar above everything else simply because it's pretty functional for group multiplayer, you know? Like mm. the bar can still be raised pretty high as far as quality level for these things and it's 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 okay, but it's not. It has it, potential. It, yeah, it's like not it didn't really, really there. It didn't blow <laughs> yeah. me away. You it, feel yeah, very right? lackluster, yeah. like average, middling. All of those words seem about right. And yeah. after the three hours, I was like, I don't know how to contextualize this in in a way that is useful. It's fine. I, yeah. I don't think I'd play it again. Maybe I would if they had make some huge stride uh, in 
something that I needed in features. I don't even know what it would be, though. But, like, <laughs> oh. yeah, honestly, it, it's very difficult to uh, recommend simply based on the fact that, like, Nick is kind of struggling with it, too, but there's really not a lot that stands out about it. You know, like, it's just, it's kind of just run of the mill and it does it well enough to uh, warrant enough people buying it. I guess like it's mm. just it's very average and there's there's not a lot to be said about it beyond that. Uh yeah, I'm done. If you're, yeah, if me you're too. good. Okay, cool. Yeah, that's the wild date. Uh again, as I mentioned, it's in early access came out originally in February, just released their point seven update and I think a little Halloween thing uh just recently as well. They are aiming to be in early access for another few months, hopefully having a full release Q1 2018. There you go. Uh, I'm going to talk really briefly about Wunder Doctor, which is, uh, as I mentioned, top of the show, kind of a mashup of games like WarioWare, Little Inferno, and uh, has gameplay very similar to Papers, Please. So, in Wunder Doctor, you are a traveling doctor who is attempting to treat the ailments of various patients that are boarding your train. Uh, they uh, they range from things like gross pimples to these weird abrasions to these like horn things that will fly out from them these little bugs that'll fly around there's all these very crazy and uh, artistically impressive ailments that befall these folks and you uh, have to do your best to cure them with your little uh, pointer hand as quickly as possible before the time runs out on your little candle buddy uh, and that's the gist of it it's it's got a good amount of variety to it but it's only like three to four hours, and that's a little generous, actually. I think I finished it in like two and a half, so there's there's not a ton of meat here, but it is, uh, I think, really, really well done and delivers on the promises that it makes pretty uh, splendidly. So really don't have too much to say about it, honestly. I think the uh, I think the gist of it is, you know, that, that mashup of Little Inferno and Papers, Please. And uh, it's just it's just a cute little fun game that I that I just kind of wanted to recommend because I don't think it's getting a ton of attention and I enjoyed it quite a bit. So there we go. It's it's Wunder Doctor. Questions, concerns, comments. No? Sounds fine to me. It's yeah. actually a good segue to the next one that I'm going to talk about because I have a roughly equal amount to say about it. So it's good. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. So that's Wunder Doctor. It just came out uh, a couple of weeks ago. It's only I want to say yeah, ten bucks. It's only ten bucks, and I think it's worth every penny. So there you go. And now let's let Nick real quick. Talk about Air Memories of Old. Air Memories of Old by Develop Forgotten Key. I believe it is their first game. Just came out this week. Uh, it is an exploratory narrative-driven adventure where you play as a lady who seems to be imbued with the power to turn into a bird. And your objective is to explore a series of floating islands while you learn about why there are floating islands. Uh, and it's very straightforward in that fact. Like You just can take your time, look at all the nature, make friends with some nice animals, just kind of scope out the scenario, see what's going on, meet spirit animals. There's like an awesome ass Arctic bear that you can make friends with. There's cute little birds and little houses, um, variety of different uh, like biomes of floating islands to visit, some people that give you objectives and some temples to visit. Uh, and it's very light puzzling, like about as light as you can consider a puzzle to be a puzzle. Uh, like find these five platforms and stand on them kind of levels. Okay. So it's just about as close to a walking simulator without being a walking simulator as you get. They they revel in the beauty and the aesthetic of the flying around. And they do a great job with that. It feels good to fly around. It looks good. It sounds good. And it's just a very soothing experience to go wander and, and visit all of these things. I played about an hour or so of it. I was not disappointed. Uh, it's very pretty to look at. And it seems like the lore goes fairly deep uh, if you're particularly engaged in that. I wouldn't say that I was the most engaged in the lore, but that is kind of the primary uh, attracting force other than just the visuals. But it's a very pretty game, um, and I do recommend it if you like that type of thing. I understand it's probably not for everybody, but I had a very nice time with it. It's very relaxing. Mm -hmm. Sweet. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to figure out if these guys have really done anything else, and it looks like this is their first project. So Yeah. Came out quite well. Mm-hmm. Good stuff. All right. It's Air Memories of Old. Just released on uh, Steam October 25th. It's 15 bucks. You can get it right It feels now. a little bit like Zelda Skyward Sword, but without the Zelda parts. Mm -hmm. Where you're just kind of flying around the islands. Got it. Anyway. Cool. All right. 
Let's hear about uh, Zachtronic's new joint. It's Opus Magnum, Ryan, please. Opus Magnum, yeah, it's a new game from Zachtronics. You may know from Shenzhen I, Infinite Factory, Space Chem, uh, TIS 100, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, uh, is essentially a game where you build machines that assemble molecules, but not in a chemical sense, in an alchemical sense. So you are combining runes of like water and fire, salts, turning lead into gold, et cetera, et cetera. It's essentially a puzzle game where you build a machine and issue it instructions so it automatically constructs elements for you. Mm-hmm. There's your, your brief introduction. That's a very good I'm introduction. Actually, see, the thing is, I'm a sucker for these regardless. So I'm actually more interested to hear what Nick is going to say about Opus Magnum. Sure. Because yeah. my pr perspective of Opus Magnum is that it's actually probably the most... Uh, non zactronics friendly game that he's made in the same kind of genre. Because he didn't make Ironclad Tactics like four years ago, which was a, a strategy card mm. deck building game. But like in the vein of puzzle analytical games, um, this is the one you don't need a programmer's mindset to play this. You don't need like a high school education in chemistry to have any foundation. Basically, there's just a very narrow rule set of the ways that things interact and the kinds of components that you can add to your machine. And then it's all just visually kind of assembling a machine that does what you want it to do. So I'm interested to know what Nick says. Mm -hmm. I feel like it is programming, but also it's visual programming. Is that acceptable? Like a yes. drag and drop kind of programming? You, I mean, okay, I mean, it depends on how... I'm not throwing it back to you. Just, no, I'm I know, just I know. It, it, depends, it depends how semantic you want to go. Because, like, it is... <laughs> you, you are building... You're issuing instructions to a machine, and it is executing them exactly as you And it looks it beautiful to. when it does it. Very Some of true. those really complex machines that you've probably seen the GIFs all over Twitter. People keep posting them. It mm -hmm. looks so good. And that is what initially got my attention on this. And you should keep in mind, I have bought all of the other Zactronics games... And none of them have hooked me more than maybe two hours. I really wanted to love Space Chem. I'm just too stupid to play it. Hmm. Uh, and this one, I don't feel that way, actually. I feel like this one, I have potential to maybe stick it out. Um, and that is coupled with a much uh, less difficulty wall kind of feeling tutorial. They actually step you through in a pretty reasonable way, nice slow pace, and you get to play as an arrogant douchebag at the beginning, too, which everybody loves doing that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. How, does the character actually matter much throughout the story? I think it depends on uh, how much you care about it. I don't care about it at all. So yeah. my perspective on the game is that there's too much dialogue. Before oh. every puzzle, <laughs> my dude is like, hey, I need to build uh, boner pills. And then the lady goes, why? And they go, I guess the king needs a boner. And then they add like a little joke at the end. And I'm like, I don't click, 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 click. Yeah, someone who like, plays <laughs> Divinity 2 with you. Wow, that's surprising. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm, I'm there for the gameplay. I'm not there for the, the dialogue. And it's, yeah, it's all skippable it all. like super quickly. So yeah. I feel like, yeah, they do that dialogue back and forth. And then at the end, the guy's always like, but good thing he came to me because I can make the best boner pills on earth. Yeah. Like he's got to throw that in there every time. But anyway, that doesn't matter. Um, there's not a ton of uh, complication to it, which I really like. There's a, a nice base level of what, like 20 parts and beyond that, it's all just how you use them and how you streamline them. So you get pretty facile with the basic stuff. And then the idea is you do these increasingly more complex machines. And then you go back and you look at the leaderboards and you try and make them for cheaper and more efficient. And uh, what's the other one? Faster processing. Like cheaper, faster, and like take up less space on the, yeah. on the board. So your objectives are actually layered. Like you can just accomplish the goal and move on, or you can accomplish it and try and streamline it, which is nice. Because if you're not into it as much, you can keep going and you just finish the story out and move on. Or you can stick with it and keep trying to iterate and make more beautiful, elegant machines. Well, I think that's like the important thing for people to keep in mind if they saw other Zactronic stuff and were like, that looks too hard for me, is that Opus Magnum is actually, and this might be like almost a clickbaity thing to say but the game is easy it's just not easy to get great solutions like in the end you're almost just doing like a lego assembly you have this you know what you have to do to turn it into this you could take you could use a million parts and the like the entire board and have it be incredibly slow and and get done like actually completing the puzzle is easy which has never been true in his actronics game like i have 
washed out of Shenzhen IO on puzzles where I just go, I have no idea how to even approach this. And Space Chem was like, I there there were once we got to the part where you would have to have like multiple reactors and almost like factorio things together afterwards. I was like, I'm I'm done with this. It's too complex. But Opus Magnum, I can sit down and I, you know, I look at a puzzle and I go, all right, if I give myself half an hour, I can solve this puzzle. It might not be great. I'll probably be on like the far right side of like all the histograms and then I can optimize later if I want. But just actually completing it even badly is satisfying and also like completely doable, I think. Hmm. I, I gotta say there's probably some percentage of people that just won't have the patience to do the troubleshooting trial and error stuff. That'll probably be the, the small contingent that washes out. I think you absolutely everyone could do it. It's just whether or not you care to go through the iteration that might be what separates some people out. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, there are some times where like, I'll admit I get a little frustrated with the game sometimes because you're, you're like, it has the ability to play pause and then like go a step forward in the instructions that you've issued. Yeah. Sometimes you'll, you'll go through like 20 steps and you just have one, two, few rotations. You add a rotation and then you realize that by adding that rotation, you step, 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 step. Oh, now it collides with this thing at this point. So I got to go like, and like, you know, move everything around. <laughs> you do spend a lot of the time essentially debugging your own solution. There's a, there's a lot less time being like, I'm going to craft the solution and a lot more time being like, this is what's wrong. Go back to the start and then pull it out. Uh, they do I have agree. Good tools though to fix it easily, which I think is great. So the one thing I, I, I agree, but I do wish, and someone in chat said this as well, I wish they Copy had a paste. step step backwards, which is uh, basically like, you know, oh, I went one too far. Just let me go back one space instead of having to go all the way back to the start and then click, 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 click. But anyway. Like you can, you can box select a whole bunch of commands and then just drag them over, which I think is really handy if you need to insert something or uh, see how a time step would react if you had nothing there for a second. Um, there's also like literally a command that does everything in reverse to get it back to a default state, which yeah. is really helpful. Uh, obviously, in certain situations, it would actually not be helpful, but when it is there and you want it, it's there, it's good. It's also a very elegant game and very pretty, uh, very polished even for a not finished game. Um, I had no bugs, uh, really no problems with it at all. It just works the way it's designed. So props. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the solutions yeah. are like genuinely mesmerizing to look at. Mm -hmm. Like uh, the best thing that they've done for these games is add that like record GIF button because it's so easy Great. to just take your solution. <laughs> you got it on the desktop, share it to Twitter, takes two seconds. And then you look at it and you go, oh, I can do better than that idiot. And then you do worse and you're like, well, maybe I'm the idiot. But over the course of a long time of optimization, you could eventually put it, you know, to the point where you're slightly better, unless you're friends with Tyler Glale, in which case you're screwed. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I think I think it's accessible. It scratches pretty much the same itch as the earlier Zachtronics games. And uh, I, I mean, I put like maybe six or seven hours into this already. I've been wow, that's, kind of, hmm. yeah, kind of like ritualistically playing like an hour or two a night. And I'm maybe like halfway through it, but I'm also kind of bad at it. But I think that this is the kind of game that, that is going to be maybe an... an what's the word uh, a gateway drug for like some people to get into these kinds of games or just to enjoy it by itself, which is also cool. When you but play, I think it says a really great shot to be like on my top 10 of the year for sure. When you played Shenzhen or even maybe space Kim to a degree, did you play those and feel like you were learning something like you were getting an educational experience out of it, or maybe even reinforcing things that you had already learned? Sort of, I guess like, Shenzhen is basically like programming or it's at least like software engineering. Like you use kind of similar patterns, but I don't really think it's like school. Mm -hmm. And that's if people look at these games, they go like, dude, if you ever want to laugh, like go read the negative reviews of Space Camp. There's people who have played it and are like, it's I'm like Nick said, like I'm not intelligent enough to handle this. I am with you. I'm with you 100%. Mm -hmm. I was basically not intelligent enough to I respect play it either. It though. It's just yeah, not that, for me. <laughs> that game is like, people People are going to bounce off it for sure. Yeah. But the reviews are like, the negative ones, which is like 2% are like, it's like school. I don't know what this game developer's thinking. It's like being in chemistry class. <laughs> like it's an abstract yeah. concept that is for games, basically. But mm. um, I, I don't know. I didn't really feel like it was learning. But it kind of, it's a similar sort of workflow, I guess. You know, you look up how to do something, you try to do it. It's probably a little bit wrong. And then you 
just tinker with it until you get it working and then that puts you on the second phase and then you figure out how to do the second phase and et cetera, et cetera. So that's the other element that I'm curious about as well with these. Cause the, I, I feel very strongly like you have mentioned that this is going to be the gateway game that allows me to actually enjoy experiences like this, the Zachtronics sort of vibe, but like it's, it's, it's difficult to approach just because the, the level of complexity is just completely off-putting for those. But this one at least is like, oh, I can kind of see what's happening. I can, I, I can kind of get a visual representation of, oh yeah, no, I see that they're trying to do, yes. they're trying to turn X into Y. And that was not really the case with the previous games as much. So let, let me put it this way. Like in Shenzhen IO, I'm trying to think of like the early puzzles in that game, but they'll be like, hey, you have a box you can type things into and you have a wire that connects that box to other boxes. And we need you to um, print the I numbers one to, ten on the yeah. 1 to 20 on the screen or something like that. Yeah. If you have never programmed at all, you got no concept really of what you You don't have even have a starting block. E exactly. So like as, as someone who, you know, is somewhat familiar with programming, you would be like, oh, so I have to like, construct a for loop using whatever the game's language is. So I'm going to need a counter and I'm going to need to iter uh, increment that counter by one every time it outputs and blah, blah, blah. The Opus Magnum does not need that because Opus Magnum is like, hey, you got two, you got a blue and an orange. You need to make a blue plus an orange. Right. So you just, everybody is like on the same minimum level because the rules are like, the, the rules are made up for that particular game. There's even a chart if you get lost with what turns into what. Like yes. you can see the progression of golds going up the scale or metals going up the scale to gold. Mm -hmm. um, you probably won't get lost on that, thankfully. Um, if you get lost on anything, it'll be the moment where they go, okay, nothing is on the board, go. Yeah. And then yeah. you're supposed to create your own objective, realizing what your choices are from the toolbar. Thankfully, there's very few, so you figure it out pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. That was the closest I got to getting stuck was like, wait, isn't there supposed to be something I deliver to? But no, you put that there too. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it seems seems like the general consensus is that this is like if you're looking for the entry point, this is it. So, and you don't even have to think about it like that because I know maybe an exit. That's <laughs> maybe yes. Yeah. When, when people are like, oh, you know, if you've always wanted to play this stuff, this is the starter for you. That kind of makes it seem like you know your goal from playing this game is to eventually go back and play the the adult Zagtronics games, <laughs> which the is real like, ones. That's like dozens or maybe even hundreds of hours of your time. Yeah. That's like way too intimidating an ask. Opus Magnum, like by itself, is just really good. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think like that's all that needs to be said. And if you if you get it and you like it, I would definitely recommend Shenzhen IO. It's definitely like a step up in terms of idiosyncrat idiosyncrasy. This is in complexity because you are like literally opening a PDF half the time. I thought or, Space Cam was the next logical progression from this. I mean, it, Space so? Cam is the same game more or less, which is I mean, is a good thing I think, but. Uh, I mean, I just like Shenzhen IO more. Okay. Mm -hmm. But then we're getting, we're about to get into like a higher order of my own ass discussion of how like, you know, this, these kind of games, really they're not teaching you syntax, they're teaching you a, a way to solve problems. And then, then you can apply that agnostically across the other games. But I think also Space Cam gets too hard too fast, but I haven't played it in like six years, so. Sweet. All right, there we go. Opus Magnum, it is available now. It came out October 19th. It is 20 bucks on Steam. Mathis, your turn to nerd out. Want to talk about Cataclysm for a bit? <laughs> Speaking of games that are impossible to break through, uh, <laughs> Cataclysm Dark Days Ahead, yeah. Uh, this is only a matter of time. This is one of those games where like, it's always been on my list of things to play and learn and enjoy. Mm. Um, it is very much the catalyst to a lot of other survival games. A lot of Project Zomboid and other survival games you can see have drawn from what Cataclysm has done over the past decade or so of its development. It's very much like Dwarf Fortress in that it's free to play, and uh, you can just download it, and it's been being developed open source for, like like I said, like a decade. It's got countless mods. Um, basically, the, the, um, the theme around Cataclysm Dark Days Ahead is one day every cataclysm happened. Zombies rose from the grave. Dimensions to other hellscapes opened, and, and invaders came. Uh, every horrible government science project that was happening broke free, and the world just went to shit. And now you are whatever character you'd create and you are to survive for however long you can. Um, it is an ASCII style game, so it's butt ugly. Uh, you can make it look prettier with tile sets, which I highly recommend you do. And it's much closer to a more uh, traditional roguelike than say something like Isaac, where it's turn-based, completely randomly generated, the entire world 
uh, has a rule set at which it generates. Um, so there's like cities and fields and stuff. So it, the world makes sense. Uh, it's really, really difficult in that it is the most detailed, complex survival game that I have ever played, ever. Mm -hmm. You're managing things like the layers of clothing that you're wearing, the encumbrance on individual limbs. Uh, if your left hand is getting cold and you don't cover it up in the wintertime, eventually it'll get frost nipped and frost bite and you need to deal with that. Uh, sometimes wounds are so deep you need to get stitches and you need to either like... Um, you need to have like a first aid skill to do that or you're going to botch it and kind of do like do this terrible stitching job. If your right leg breaks, you need to go out into the woods and break branches and make a splint and splint your leg. It's very, 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 <laughs> very complicated. It's hard for me to really go in depth or just how in depth that the game goes. It simulates so many things at so many levels that uh, it would take me like 15 minutes just to go through everything it, it plays. It's not a game for everybody by any stretch. I think... If you like games like Dungeons and Dragons and you can really use your imagination, these are the types of games that are built to tell a story. And every time you play, it tells a really, really interesting and kind of cool story. And the example I'll give is like the first six episodes I did on the on my YouTube channel, which was I made I made Ryan and I played through as Ryan Letourneau and I, I tried to, to the best of my ability, like mimic and, and build him and his skills that would fill like fit into the game. Um, and and the story that was told his last moments more or less were uh, I finally discovered a town not far from a farm uh, that I stumbled across and the farm was abandoned. Uh, the, the house inside of it had like leftover military gear and a survival map, um, but it was completely abandoned. There was not much inside of it, but the barn itself was completely boarded up and locked and I could hear noises coming from inside that barn which was really cool. And I was like, oh, that's very Walking Dead. Yeah, I've seen Keep season it. two. I know how Yeah, this exactly. <laughs> but uh, remember, this is all randomly generated <laughs> stuff. So I'm like, there's noises coming from inside the barn. It's very clear the military was at this house at some point. And I'm, I'm a little nervous to open up that door. Eventually, I've, I gear up a bit and I open it up. And there's like three zombies in there and the corpses of two horses that have been ripped apart uh, over the course of the past like mm -hmm. two days that I've been playing the game. Uh, I was able to get through and fight the zombies, though, walking away kind of like a, with a torn up right leg. My backpack had been ripped open and all the contents of my backpack spilled onto the ground. And I was surrounded by mutant ants and like all this other stuff. So I had to make a split decision. Yep, go for it. And my split decision was to abandon my old base and go up the road and to see what's in town. I was walking along the road and I found an old police car that had a little bit of gas left and 6% battery life. And I was able to kickstart the car and take the car into town. And in town... The car makes a ton of noise and all these zombies come out and I'm ramming the car, uh, uh, the zombies with the car until the car doesn't go anymore to the point where I eventually kind of climb out of the car, try and fight my way out, get surrounded by zombies and then eventually just get torn apart by them. Um, all this is being told, by the way, in just like little tile sets of like moving along the map and the description is happening on the right side where it tells you the details of things that are happening. If you have an imagination, you kind of like let yourself kind of fall into this world. The game is... is really deep, like I said, and complex, and it's a great storytelling device in a way that a lot of games aren't. I think Cataclysm to Roguelikes is what Dwarf Fortress is to like management simulation games. Mm -hmm. It's that deep. There's not a learning curve, there's a learning wall, and you have to either just like say, fuck it, I'm going to climb this thing, or you got to back away. Um, I just said, fuck it, I'm going to learn it. And the more I learn about the game and the more I realize there's just how deep the game goes, the more interesting the stories become every single time I play because now I know how to manage certain aspects of my survivor and how to kind of navigate totally. the world and what to listen for and what to look for. Um, and, and like, like s simple things like my character being a not fed well and I'm feeding him only like steak and meat is bad for his health in the long term and that can affect how, uh, how far he can go without losing stamina and how loud he is when he walks and... <laughs> fatty liver or something that's way too yeah, like, <laughs> that's insane yeah, like, no, um, but but again the game also allows you to, to put mods in to negate that stuff if you don't want to deal with it okay but you can go as deep as like all the clothes that the zombies wear are filthy and if you get hurt or cut while wearing filthy clothes the chance of infection happening so in order to wear those clothes you need to find soap in, in running oh, water and, and clean the clothes it can be as deep as you want and i really love it but damn it's hard sounds like it's gold rush very, players very, would love this Oh yeah, I know. Totally it is not that. a game for everybody. What I love is that the comments in the in the videos are like, I would never play this game, but I love listening to you kind of dictate the story mm -hmm. and like t 
tell the story of what's happening to your character and like Ryan Ryan's character that I made basically I made him I had him tie a rock to a stick with a rag for a cudgel and I beat a zombie moose to death like and that that it sounds like a very inter- Ryan thing like a very that, that whole interaction in game was not fun to look at but when you read out the descriptions and you kind of imagine it there's a lot of fun to be had there but mm. I realize that is not for everybody and it's a very niche kind of game but I, I love a- it there's an indie game that I was thinking of. Mathis, you might actually like this. Um, Project Zomboid, I think it is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. Weird, right? It's actually, is that like that? Zomboid pulls a ton of inspiration from Cataclysm. Like, mm. It's very clear that Zomboid is yanking a ton of inspiration from it. But it's way more... Zomboid, outside of looking prettier, because it uses like an engine, um, is not nearly as deep and is more approachable. So if you think Zomboid is hard, Cataclysm is like that times like a hundred. Okay, so I'm not playing Cataclysm then. Fair enough. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> it's so, f- but it's fun. That's so funny to me that you can say, you know, it's like this game, but it uses an engine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's a discerning yeah. point, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. No, it, it's it's uh, it's interesting. I didn't think I was gonna even um, enjoy it really until I, I was like fuck I'm just gonna give it a shot and then I, I honestly think my 16 17 years of playing Dungeons and Dragons have really helped me yeah. enjoy games like this because it all happens up here mm-hmm. like it's not happening on the screen <laughs> you know what I mean you're just seeing like you you swing at a zombie and you hear the whack and then it just shows numbers or like whatever but that's it there's no visual representation of you hitting a zombie and breaking his legs and now he can only crawl on the ground and stuff like that. Or the zombie grabbing hold of me and then vomiting acid down my throat to the point of dying. Like, that that happens in the game, but it's not, you don't see it. I love that you, being the uh, the member of this show that is usually uh, very interested in the story and the lore and the exposition, decided to tell the story of Ryan Letourneau, who is yeah. almost entirely the opposite of that in game. Yeah. <laughs> Nope, Ryan would absolutely loathe this game on every level. It is not something that, but I think I that's, know. I think the majority of people would not enjoy this game. You know, this is for yeah, a very yeah. niche audience, but for a YouTube series and people who enjoy survival games and, and the emergent stories that come out of it, this makes for great a great storytelling device. As long as you have the imagination or at least the vocabulary to tell the story on a video so people can at least listen along. Sure. It does surprisingly well for a series that looks as ugly as it does. Mm-hmm. Cool. So, uh, yeah, so where fun. can people like, so there's the cataclysm website. I just want to make sure I'm directing people. Just, to you the can right Google place. like, there's a ton of places you can download it. I would just Google like the cataclysm dark days ahead launcher. Mm-hmm. And that, that thing, it, the game updates daily with like tons yeah. of fixes. And stuff. I was going to say SEO might be a little tricky because there's another rather popular thing that has cataclysm. Yeah. in it. Mm-hmm. But yeah, maybe it'll yeah. be on page five. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Uh, so yeah, like you said, you can just Google it. There is the, I, I believe this is the official website. Is it en dot cataclysm dot com? Does that sound it right? It might be. Okay. I just googled be... launcher and got the okay. launcher. There you go. Ah, uh, so we got the Jackbox Party Pack four. Ryan, will you tell me uh, about your experiences with that uh, recently here? It's another Jackbox party pack mm-hmm. this is the one that they have created it is the sequel to the jackbox party pack three now come on um, come on now so Very i mean so what it basically comes down to is how does this compare to other jackbox <laughs> games a lot of people have said that they think it's the worst i Whoa. actually like very much disagree i think that at least from a streamer's perspective it's one of the best so of the games in it um there's fibbage three which seems to be fibbage but more and also there's a, like a streamer specific mode more well not streamer specific mode but a mode where the the identity of the players actually matters because they enter truths and lies about themselves that that can be engaging to play especially if you you know know people that you're playing it with and you can call them on their bullshit and then there's monster seeking monster which is basically like a digital version of the game mafia or werewolf or town of salem which is really cool, and audience gets to play it, which is nice as well. I think that might actually be, like, the best game that they've ever made. I don't know if it's actually, uh, like, that engaging to play or watch forever, but as far as, like, a game that's not just like, hey, type in a meme, you know, I think that this is, it's got the best rules of any game that they've ever made. Bracketeering, Mm -hmm. I think, is kind of garbage. It's basically, they give you one quiplash prompt. Like, what, what would be a bad 
thing to order at a Chinese restaurant. And then everybody types in one answer and they just fight it out over and over and over and over and over with some twists that happen. But, you know, it's kind of, they're just repeating the punchlines over again and again and again. Mm. And um, it might be better with more people. We'll see. Civic Doodle is the requisite drawing game that your mileage may vary depending on how much you enjoy that sort of stuff. And wait, there's, oh, Survive the Internet is yeah, yeah. Uh, is an interesting one where you basically, they give you a prompt and you type something, like the prompt will be like, write a review of Applebee's. And you'll be like, oh, it's too expensive for what, you know, for how full you get. And then the other person will get your answer and they try to make you look like a horrible person by taking you out of context. So they'll replace that Applebee's prompt with like, what do you think of the plus size gigolo house? And you know, it's too expensive for how full you get. And then you, everyone goes, ah, he, did, he couldn't have possibly what foreseen he that coming. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Chad's kind of right. It's kind of like, you know, edgelords the game. But yeah, I think yeah. if you're playing it in, in a group of like-minded individuals, it can be really funny, except for the fact that probably like 20% of chat is like, this is not okay. And then, you know, a certain portion of the other 80% was like, why is it not okay? Have you heard of the First Amendment? And we were all just kind of in the Discord call, like, is we don't need to go down this road. Mm. So, um, but yeah, I think it's, I think it's really good. My perspective of earlier Jackbox packs is that essentially they had one banger and then one thing that was okay. And then the rest of them, I never wanted to play again. Mm -hmm. uh, this one, I think it has like two or three bangers. And then three times I could, is good. I, yeah, I could probably get away with never playing Civic Doodle again as long as I live. And we might give Bracketeering one more shot, but I think I would probably be okay with never playing Bracketeering again. But Monster Seeking Monster allowing the audience to play is really fun. Fibbage 3 seems to have more variety because once you run out of prompts, you can play it endlessly with people writing in their own answers. And uh, what was the third Survive one? Survive the Internet. Survive the Internet. It, you know, we'll see. It's kind of a volatile mix. but Yeah. Uh, Nick, similar opinions? Uh, I didn't like any of them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm basically, I'm fighting a PR war about this game right now because I'm just super not into it, but also, like, mm. uh, whatever. Um, is it for I the obvious reasons, or is it, like, are there... No, I just, I, do, I don't like the layers of abstraction. I completely grant that having chat play along is cool for Monster Seeking Monster. That's fine. That yeah, makes yeah. a lot of sense. Uh... I, I don't like the idea, though, that there's all of these conditions that are happening off screen that I don't really understand how to play, but things are just kind of going and triggering. And then I find out later that I did or didn't win. It's, I feel like I'm just kind of playing a carnival game, throwing a ring on a bottle and waiting to find out if I won. It's like it didn't take any skill, and also I don't know what happened. They so, still could do a better job of having the host the information that the host has being put to everybody's screen in a way that allows them to keep track of it without like forcing them to commit it to mental memory like mm. it it's definitely i'm going to be biased towards it because i have the big screen in front of me that has all the information so i'm like the dungeon master i know what's happening and i don't have to ask questions but everybody else is like a little bit more in the dark for sure because they're just kind of like lost in space on their phones well, all of the games i think think exclusively all of them uh, involved very little actual interaction and mostly just looking at a bright colored screen for maybe 80% of the game. Mm. And that's not fun. <laughs> I mean, I want to be part of the game in a more direct way, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And I just don't find that to be particularly engaging. And the fact that they haven't allowed or they haven't iterated on the concept of their party pack at number four and allowed you to kick people or allowed you to share your screen, like why? What do you? This is important stuff. Yeah. To be this far along and not consider that that's a big deal because we had people get into the games that we don't know how they got in. We just had to roll with it. I'm pretty sure that they just guessed. Yeah, maybe they did. <laughs> <laughs> so, how long? When does the Jackbox pack become the now? That's what I call music of Steam. Where like it might already be there for you some think people. So? I, think. <laughs> I mean, like, I I still think that. I, I'm like inverted in my Jackbox opinions from a lot of people. Mm. I talk to people, they go like, oh, I love TKO. I played so much TKO. And I'm like, TKO is garbage. <laughs> but, you know, it, I guess it's cool. It, your mileage may vary with respect to this stuff. But yeah, I would be okay seeing a Jackbox game once a year for the rest of all time. But 
I also have kind of a vested interest in that because she, because chat loves watching it. And, you know, I, I do like games that allow you to kind of bring your own creativity for better or worse to the, uh, to the table. That's why I think like Quiplash is kind of like a perennial good game because every time, sure the prompts can get old from time to time, but like every time it's going to be a little different depending on the jokes that people are able to construct. So mm -hmm. I, I don't get how civic doodle was a finished thing that they said, let's ship this. What <laughs> civic doodle. The, the selling point of it is the what fact is that the point? <laughs> you can actually see on the screen what people are drawing, which is the first time it's, they've ever had that. It's just a collaborative MS paint game. Yes. With no real winner. <laughs> just play. You just if, paint until you're done and then you're done. Well, if you're drawing wins, you get points. <laughs> Yeah, I, but what does it mean to get points? It's it well, that's a pretty bold <laughs> question, <laughs> isn't it, Jesus? <laughs> I don't know. I feel like when we play Pintrillo, like we're leading up to something, and that game felt like it was taking my time away somehow. Anyway, that's yeah. enough out of me. Uh, nobody cares what I say about this. <laughs> no, it's not that. Like, I think that there's definitely there's a point to be made. Like pe some people are not going to be into the Jackbox style of things. I do think you're at a disadvantage as well from not being the host. I think that, mm. like, I'm obviously, I'm going to be like a plus four relative to your opinion just on the virtue of being able to see the screen. Like, right. I could totally see if someone else was hosting Jackbox. I don't really want to, you know, be in the game without control over it. So I, I think you have a point in that. Mm. I, do, cool. I think, like, I wish that they just made less bad ones. There's well, a couple. I, I mean, they can't only... ship it with only two or three really good games. It's got to have yeah, at least can't... like five or six, right? The, what they need to do is stop releasing new numbers and make it a platform that they release new games for. They Why just can't... make it the Jackbox Party Pack. Yeah, yeah, they, that could be cool as well. And then the other thing is, I'm with Nick 100 percent on like, there's some huge quality of life improvements you could have. Give the host the ability to kick players. Literally um, erase things. Why yeah. is that a lot to ask? A like an, an undo button in like the drawing games would be good. Hmm. But like at the same time, it's kind of like those are quality of life opinions, but they aren't necessarily essential for the Jackbox experience. Like I think these are the kind of games that are mostly meant to be played. For people who don't stream, it's like, hey, I've got, you know, five people coming over tonight. Let's have some drinks and play Jackbox. So it's kind of, you make a mistake, you just go, you know, it pops up on the screen in 15 seconds and everyone goes, whoa, what did you do? You made a mistake. And then you laugh about it. So mm. they're like $30 games, aren't they? 25. 25. And this is the fourth it's, one of those. Yeah. I feel like erasing is not a lot to ask for. But it's <laughs> different mentality. It, Clearly, they don't care. It's, you know, it's gold, gold Rush is a $20 game. <laughs> Would a tutorial be <laughs> too much to ask for? It's not the fourth Gold Rush game, is what I mean. No. It's God a valid willing. point. <laughs> I, I see where Nick's come from as far as like, why don't they just do like a games as a service kind of thing and charge for individual games and have yeah, like a I'm I'm honestly surprised they're not at this point, aren't you? Like, like that it, would make the most sense. Yeah. I'm not surprised, I guess, because if you look at like Jelly Vision's business model, it's straight up like crank you know, it ten, out, make ten money. years ago, yeah, they're like we're we're making like a you don't know Jack game every four months. So mm. you don't know Jack sports, you don't know Jack movies, et cetera, et cetera. Subscription service next. I mean, it, it almost is like a... But I mean, it's weird because, like, Zachtronics does the same thing. Like, once a year, Zachtronics comes out with a new puzzle game that is, like, sort of programming. Once a year, Jackbox comes out with, like, a suite of new games, some of which are good and some of which are, you know, mixed. But I I don't know. In terms of, like, value per dollar, I've probably gotten more m more value per dollar out of all of the Jackbox games than like 98% of my Steam library. But you are in a pretty unique position as far as I that's agree concerned. with that as well, yeah. All right, there we go. Jackbox Party Pack 4. Like we said, 25 bucks just came out last week. It's available now. Uh, okay, so I was the only one that played South Park, right? Nope, I played oh, it. Oh, you did? Okay. I haven't, beaten it. I haven't beaten it yet, but I'm playing through it right now. Let me hear your thoughts then on South Park the Fractured but Whole Mathis. Sure, it's the stick of truth with the new combat system. Mm -hmm. yep. The end. It is, <laughs> it is exactly the same as as uh, as as the stick of truth, uh, which is depending on if you like South Park, great or terrible. Um, the humor is spot on. The writing is great so far. Um, the story is hilarious, but it's also the same trappings as as the first game, where like 
you looting everything and it just kind of yields garbage for the most part. Mm. There's a crafting system now, but it's negligible for the most part. I'm playing on the hardest difficulty combat wise and it's still really easy. Like it's still not that hard, but I do love the change from like more Final Fantasy or, or Paper Mario combat to grid-like style combat. There's a little bit more thought that has to go into it um, because your moves now will hit certain areas on the grid and some will knock them back and some will push them forward. So you kind of have to think like, okay, if I knock him back two squares, he's going to hit the card and he'll take extra damage. Or if I push him forward uh, a square, he's going to be next to one of my uh, party members and he could just attack them right away. A little bit of thought, usually not that much. Um, but if the town is kind of the same thing, you, you, uh, you, it's the same layout as, as stick of truth. You'll be wandering and invading people's homes and looting everything for all the references for the many, many years South Park has been on. If you really love stick of truth, you're just, you're gonna love, uh, the fractured butthole. It is the same game in, in for good or for bad. Mm. It's kind of cool. Cause the game picks up right at the end of stick of truth. Like you play a little, like the first 30 minutes of, of, fractured butthole are like they're still playing fantasy stick of truth and then it kind of goes into the new one so it's like the next day more or less uh and you have a whole new adventure mm -hmm. uh unfortunate news uh i did catch a single frame of south park strip club boob in the in the trailer there so oh, we're, no. we're demonetized forever we're sorry yeah <laughs> we had a good run well Support the Patreon, I guess. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely having a similar experience. I didn't play a ton of The Stick of Truth. I played, I think, like two or three hours, and it's oh, really? very, very, very similar, though. Uh, but the combat has definitely improved. Uh, it's, however, like, I, I, again, this is another one of those games where I have to, f I, I find myself asking the question, would I enjoy this game if I didn't like the source material so much? No. No, is the def no. definitive answer there. Is like, if this was not a South Park game, it is wholly unremarkable. And there's a, yeah. there's a good pun for you. Uh, it's like, <laughs> it's just kind of boring. Isn't it like walking around the town? Like it's funny, and like you said, like you're just collecting garbage for the most part. And there are like there's jokes kind of hidden in the collectibles as well. You know, like you'll go to Cartman's mom's room and she'll have like an anal plug or something like that. There's like little funny South Park humor yeah. scattered throughout the collectibles in the. They did that in the first one too. Yeah, they that did that in the first one too. But yeah. like it's it's still just sort of not really all that appealing to walk around, especially because there's no run button anymore. Like, I have no fucking idea why there's not a run button, especially when there was one in the first game, but you're forced to walk mm. slowly around the entire town and do mostly, like, collectible stuff apart from the main missions in the game. And it's just really not all that enjoyable to play. The combat, too, is kind of boring, honestly. Like, it, it's it's improved, but it's not engaging. It's it's sort of just run-of-the-mill RPG combat, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, I kind of felt the same way, I guess, a stick of truth. Um, it's easy. I think the game is built for fans of South Park without question, and maybe not every South Park fan is a big gamer, and yeah. it's, it's, it's a very easy to get through. It's basically just like playing through a 12 to 15-hour episode of South Park. Yeah, and yeah, if yeah. that sounds like something you would love, then... You're going to love the Fractured Butthole. If you're, like, a casual fan of South Park, you would probably be like me, where, like, after a couple hours, it was really funny, and then I'm going to take a break until, like, tomorrow, and I'm not going to binge this at Can all. Can jump in real quick? Yeah. I just want to yeah. say, if it's a, a 12 to 15-hour episode of South Park, consider mm -hmm. the edits in a 20-minute block of South Park and how mm -hmm. punchy it all is. Yeah. Everything yeah. about that show is immediately keeping you locked in with joke, 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 joke. This game, from the little bit I watched Mathis play, is just kind of a slow, steady broil of waiting for the next moment, right? It's just walking the around and then set piece, you're pooping, walking around. Oh, I found a person on a couch. Oh, they made a, a racial slur. Okay, moving yeah. on. <laughs> so the the comedy, yeah, obviously in like an episode of South Park, like you said, it, it's contained and it's 20 minutes of bam, bam, bam. It's right in, in your face. In South Park, the, in the game, and I guess it was very similar for Stick of Truth where like there's big set pieces, which are hilarious. But then the rest of the game is like, haha, remember that? Or haha, remember that? Oh, hey, I know that place. Yeah, or hey, I've yeah. been there. Oh, I remember that from that episode. That's what this game is. And there are people who are going to fucking love it. And then people who are just not going to give a shit. And it's kind of just, you know, you're going to like it or not. Like, Ryan, are you planning on playing it? Did you play through the Stick of Truth? Yeah, I beat the Stick of Truth. And 
I don't know. It's weird because, like, on paper, I really should play the Fractured Butthole because uh, all I've heard about it is that it's basically the same except the combat is way better. Yeah. And longer. And, it's, like, double the length. Hmm. See, that doesn't appeal to me as much, but uh, Stick of Truth, I was like, it's like playing an episode of South Park. It's mm-hmm. faithful to the source material, which is cool if you're into that. But the combat basically sucked. So... I, it, basically, I was into the idea on paper of playing through a South Park game that was the same, but the combat being a little bit more like XCOM, more or less, or it, yeah, it's it, a for lack of more. a better word, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, I don't know; I just don't feel motivated to play like a twelve-hour South Park game. Yeah. No. It's, also, it's I long. haven't watched the show in like seven or eight years, so yeah. I'm not I saying I aged out necessarily, but I'm just kind of like I get it. I followed very closely with the show, and this game, for some reason, just didn't appeal to me at all. Uh, there are certain episodes that'll just be like, oh, the writing in this one was just really bad or something. And for some reason, I get that vibe from the game. It just doesn't look like it's funny to me. It's but, There are moments in that game I, that I just, had me laughing. It's funny, like, I think. Really, yeah. I, I think they're funny like moments. The superheroes. But... It feels so like intentionally set up to be a franchise thing, even though I do That's like the, the joke, art. the though. I make fun of it, but I also don't. It's just... I don't know. I, it's just not for me. But I, I don't mean to shit on it. I hear it's mostly good. Some people don't like it. But. No, it's no, it's getting mixed reviews. So it's not like you're an anomaly, honestly. Like it, there's okay. there's been a bit of a mixed bag reception to it, and rightfully so, I feel, because like we've been going over these criticisms and they're entirely valid. It's really not that good of a game at all. But we have to give it the credit it's due because it's South Park and it's funny and the story is you know like humorous enough to justify it if you like that. Uh, thing, if you like That's, South Park, basically, it was the same thing as, as Stick of Truth. The the game itself in Stick of Truth wasn't that great. Yeah, it was it was the humor and the writing that kept people engaged, and it's the same thing here. There's a little bit more depth. Mm. Combat's a little bit more strategic. There's like you can slot your gear with like runes and stuff, and all oh, they're all hilarious, and you know, and that kind of thing. And here's the but, here's the stupidest yeah. criticism I'll ever make of a game ever. Uh, you can't do the pooping mini game very well at all on the PC because oh, the imagine. the port for the controls is terrible. Like I just you're basically Aww. forced to use a controller if you want to accomplish that uh, mini game aspect of things. And I yeah, I just is... want to point out that I'm criticizing the pooping mini game in South Park because that's my life. This is I mean it, well I mean. <laughs> The pooping mini game gets repetitive as hell in that game. And so does taking selfies with literally everybody. And you have to in that game. Yeah. You have to take selfies with people. It's so, and it's it's uh, obno- it's tedious. Yeah. And I get it. It's it's commentary. It's like hilarious commentary on, you know, social media outlets nowadays. Mm. But doing it for 12 hours is fucking It's like going to TwitchCon, I think, is what they're going for. <laughs> yeah, more or less. I, I so, saw that little... <laughs> <laughs> no, I wasn't, oh, I was itching my eye. I wasn't doing that. I wasn't doing that. I, jokes. Um, jokes. Eh. It's, I'm enjoying it, but I enjoy it in very short, like two to three hour spurts, and then I'm done for the day, or I'm done for a few days. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't know if I'm going to finish it, honestly, especially now that we're in the golden age of 2017, so I've got a lot of other options to to uh, choose from. So Current year argument. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Not your ass. So there we go. Uh, the the reviews on Steam are mixed. I think we're a bit mixed here as well. But I, the 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 safest thing to say by far that remains true is if you like South Park, you're gonna like this because it's a South Park episode that you're a part yep. of. Yep. Yep. That's exactly what it is. Sixty bucks. Uh, gold version is ninety bucks. No idea what's uh, mm-hmm. going on no with that, but feel free to spend your money. <laughs> Tons of like <laughs> random gear that you can put on. That's super overpowered. It's got like. It, all the fucking Ubisoft stuff feels so out of place in this game, man. It's like, yeah, you're getting, like, the Assassin's Creed costume. Yeah, it's like, make sure you get the season pass. Here's all the Uplay exclusive equipment. It's like, get the fuck out of my South Park game, Uplay. <laughs> Is that loot crates? There's no loot crates, no. No. I actually just, I honestly thought maybe it did, because I just don't know. <laughs> anyway, South Park Fracture Beholds. 60 bucks out now. Uh, Nick, tell me about Wolfenstein 2, your early impressions here. Oh, I, yeah, okay. I thought we were just going to basically go with that. I liked it. But uh, I only played an hour and a half, mm-hmm. and I guess that might not be representative of the entire game because I don't know how long it is. Uh, I also didn't play the original uh, second reboot because there was originally Wolfenstein, then there was Return to Castle Wolfenstein, then there was The New Order, which is the third, but also the third reboot. Mm-hmm. Um, so I didn't play that. I only played this sequel from the beginning, and I was very impressed 
Uh, the tone is actually remarkably serious, even though I know, I know that's a weird thing to say about a game about Nazis. Obviously, it's going to be serious. But the thing is, it's serious in a, uh, a more appreciable tone way. It, it's a, <laughs> it rides a line. It rides a really fine line between serious and ridiculous. I, yeah, it does, but in a way that doesn't seem to make sense, yet it still works anyway. Okay. Well, I mean, like, Wolfenstein, The New Order, uh, from what, a couple of years ago, was ridiculous, but had, like, some really heartfelt, touching moments through that game. Yeah, and that threw me for a loop. I didn't know what to make of it, because all I knew about the original was you're throwing Nazis into helicopters and stuff. Like, all right, I figured it was super over the top. I didn't think it would have, like, human moments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it does. And that should probably have been obvious, but it, it wasn't. So anyway, it's really pretty. It's a really good shooter. It feels good to play. It has amazing guns. I freaking got a laser cannon in like the first 20 minutes of the game. Oh yeah. Uh, and I was like cutting holes through doors and cutting people up. Uh, there's a lot of exposition, which I also didn't expect. The game seems to take its characters very seriously. Um, you and again, the super apologies. suit that you never got in the first one? The super suit's so cool! Awesome. <laughs> it's like I, a remember, I remember suit. getting that in the first game and then be like, oh man, that's gonna be so cool, and then somebody else wore it, and you're like, no, yeah. I wanted that. <laughs> well, they apparently were thinking about the sequel when they were writing it into the first one because they have a pretty good reason why you're wearing it in this one. Sweet. So the story is pretty well considered. Uh, for being both ridiculous and serious, they did a good job writing the line. Uh, I don't know where it's going to go from here, but I'm very much invested in seeing it. Very big thumbs up from me. Nice. Good shooter. Looks gorgeous. Yeah. Also old school, too. Like, they did the, there's no regenerating health. You have to find health all the time. Mm, yeah. And, like, when you shoot the helmets off of the Nazis, that counts as 10 armor. Nice. So, like, incentivize you there, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, it's really cool. You can also take a stealth approach or a full frontal approach, whichever suits you better. Uh, it seemed to put a lot of thought into how the maps wind around itself. Uh, so you're not forced into just engaging from the same direction. Mm -hmm. So good stuff. Sweet. May uh, revisit this one if a couple more of us end up picking it up over the next week or so. But yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm excited to dive into it. Mm -hmm. Cool. Wolfenstein Two. It's available now. Sixty bucks. Digital Deluxe Edition. Eighty dollars on Steam. Uh, then another one we're likely to talk about again since we've now uh, had the opportunity to check it out on the. Whoops, sorry. Check it out on the PC. It's Destiny Two. Finally out. Uh, okay. For uh, for uncapped FPS insanity, you're on our favorite gaming machine. And uh, Nick, I want to have you take the reins here as well for your initial impressions of Destiny. Played all the games this time. I know, man. <laughs> you did a well, good we'll job. Mario next next week, mm -hmm. I guess. Mm -hmm. So Destiny is a mixed bag for a lot of people, and I'm in the camp that I I played some Destiny one. I wasn't hardcore about it at all. I am sort of really into this genre though. Like, I'm a big Borderlands fan. I love loot, grind, kind of first-person games. And there's not a ton of them, so I flock a little bit to whenever there's a new one to try out. Um, and Destiny 2 is, I guess, a competent game if you don't care particularly about the long term. Seems to be what I'm getting from it. And I've, I've only got about three hours into it, so also I'm relying a lot on other people's videos and narrative because the console version came out already a month ago. Mm. Uh, so there's a lot of thought and... and spitballing about what the scope of the game is and where they're taking it. Um, and obviously huge expectations because Destiny is a pretty big name in the industry, as I'm sure you know. Um, so the first game came out pretty flatly. Like, people were into it, but it kind of ended abruptly, and then they were waiting for expansions. The expansions eventually came. Uh, they got to take a little bit more narrative exposition, build out the universe a bit. Uh, then there was a second expansion, built it out even more. And what was... The hope, anyway, was that a lot of that same thought process was going into Destiny 2, and that the reason that they didn't flesh out the expansions even as much as they did was because they were holding back content to try and make Des Destiny 2 as robust as possible. Uh, and the thought that I've taken in from people who have way more hours into this than me is that they kind of fell short on that. Uh, the game is not so much... Uh, it's not loaded toward the end game. It's loaded towards, like, here's a really cool first few hours, and then an average middle, and then it just kind of tails off a bit. Um, there's a lot of changes that they made to try and streamline it, to take features out of it intentionally, to make it uh, less robust but more uh, focused. Um, part of that comes to the PvP. They've redone the PvP so it's a lot more competitive. Uh, the first game, I guess, was really out of whack in terms of balance, and I guess they really wanted to respond more to that. Um, they also changed away some of the endgame loot works in that it's not dice rolls on the stats. 
which was apparently kind of considered a death knell for a lot of the big fans because you can't really grind for loot anymore. You get the best gun, you have the best gun. Mm -hmm. And now you're done. Yeah, there's a couple things about that, too. Like, the fact that they have changed the scaling for the weaponry as well. So that, like, you know, you, you can get stronger weapons, but the enemies will not respond any differently to them. Like, you're dealing the same amount of damage, apparently, over the course of several levels, it seems, for different areas. So that's kind of a disappointment, too, especially for a game like this that's really kind of based on that progressive loot grind, you know? So... Yeah. Well, anyway, all that being said, uh, for someone like me who is a bit more uh, superficially interested in it, I'm not. I'm not probably going to spend 200 hours in Destiny 2. Mm -hmm. um, I had an okay time playing the beginning of it. I had some friends come in uh, from chat, and we just kind of ran through the first few missions. It's very pretty. The gunplay feels good. Um, the the powers that I had, uh, being the class that I am, actually look amazing. Like, I get a freaking sword and start slashing shit, particles and fire shooting everywhere. It feels cool. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, I think, what they're going after is more of a visceral response, just a, just a, a good feeling to it. Uh, whereas I think some people are looking toward it more for long term. Uh, I want to build a clan. I want to get this thing together so it's going to be like our game. Yeah. And... If you're not in that camp, maybe you'll have an okay time with it. If you are in that camp, maybe you won't. Uh, again, I only have a few hours, so I'm going off other people's opinions largely. Uh, but I mostly enjoyed my time with it, mm -hmm. despite a lot of negativity is what I've seen in the reviews. I've got about three, four hours now, I think. So I'm in a very similar camp with you. Uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm definitely having a good time so far. I played quite a bit of the first game as well. I, I jumped into it. Uh, uh, I think it was just after like the first big expansion, which I'm forgetting the name of now, which was uh, the Taking King. Taking King, yeah. So I think it was uh, shortly after that had come out, and there was a decent amount of uh, end game stuff already. And I uh, I played quite a bit, and I enjoyed quite a bit of my time in the first one. So playing this, I, I was expecting more of the same, and I absolutely got it. And it feels very very similar to just playing Destiny. As well, like they, they have not changed much as far as the uh, the overworld and the way that you navigate through menus all feels very familiar. Albeit, you can now use a you know keyboard and mouse and actually navigate through things extremely efficiently as opposed to having to use a controller to do it. So that's nice. But uh, yeah, it's it's not much different. And the the uh, end game stuff, I, I think it's interesting because. I don't. I don't know. Like, I. Th I think I told you this as well, Nick. But I feel like people sort of expected the post DLC level of content that Destiny had from Destiny Two out of the gate, and you know, there's that. There's very little by way of end game content right now. So not only are people disappointed by that, that but they also maybe had like false expectations of it as yeah. well. I saw a lot of people saying, like, I'm done with this game, I'm never going back to it. Like, that kind of sentiment seemed to show up in many reviews I saw, which, based on what I've seen, I mean, obviously I'm not at that point in the game, but I didn't really get that hmm. very much. And t uh, to those people we say... So nice. <laughs> <laughs> to those people we say, see uh, when the first DLC comes out. and Yeah, they probably will come back, mm -hmm. won't they? Uh, yeah, I... I think I'll uh, I'll have a little bit more to say about this as I have some uh, multiplayer experiences. That's what I'm most looking forward to, actually, is hopefully I can get through the uh, leveling pretty quickly so that we can get, go do that end, get end game raid stuff and, you know, like the really interesting things that require some actual strategy and teamwork. So might take a bit of time, I've heard. Yeah, uh, maybe. The, the difference in power level from getting to the level cap to the raid is, like, pretty big. Mm -hmm. so, so might be a bit. Time investment if you're up for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the multiplayer is actually uh, quite fun, I I have come to find. I've done a little bit of the Crucible stuff and really enjoy it. They did make an interesting choice, however, to uh, retain the aim assist on the controller in competitive multiplayer, which is a thing a lot of people are kind of up in arms about because it's very easily exploitable, apparently, on the PC. Mm. An, an aim assist that's built into the game, I guess they can... Uh, work around that with aimbots pretty easily, so that's a little bit of a disappointment. But it's well, probably not going to make a huge impact. Aimbots, thankfully, are not much of a factor because they've taken a very hard, hardline stance on cheating in Destiny Two. Oh right, yeah. Uh, anybody that uses OBS <laughs> is banned, right? That's what I'm hearing. Right. Or, <laughs> or Discord overlays as well. Like oh. No code injection. Uh, any kind of thing that interferes with the code running is a bannable permanent offense. Nice. Can't come back. So be careful out there. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, yeah, it's friggin' gorgeous. Like, oh, it's it is very satisfying to look at. Runs pretty damn well. I haven't run into any really like bugs or crashing or issues or anything like that. So we got to give them kudos uh, for that, right? I had only uh, well on launch day, which obviously take that with a grain of salt. But I got to the second part of the tutorial a couple of times, and it kept dropping my uh, connection, and then it would revert me back to the beginning. Mm. That was moderately frustrating, but I also grant launch day problems. Yeah, yeah. Didn't happen again the next time I did it. So, uh, but yeah, it's a beautiful game. Amazing soundtrack, also mm-hmm. really, really good soundtrack. Uh, the story is kind of like shit, though. Yeah, the writing is like the writing is like awful. But they do a lot of cares? they. T- it's it's so much of <laughs> this is why I'm here and this is my motivation yeah. and now you understand fully it's, my character arc. It's like, everything was this mm. until it wasn't. <laughs> That's literally like a line just like that in the very beginning, and I think they do it again at the end. The story uh, almost feels like a Kingdom Hearts kind of story, where it's like yeah. uh, the lights. We 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 all it's, feed from the light, and it's the source of humanity and. It's been taken by this ultimate evil power. and oh, so no. pretentious, it almost feels like a parody of itself, which is why I choose to just mostly ignore it and have fun playing shoot and stuff, because yeah. that's, that's the game that's for me. That's what's fun about it. About yeah, that. exactly. Okay, there we go. Destiny 2, you know all about it by now. There's a couple of $100 versions you can pick up if you like, but otherwise 60 bucks over exclusively on Battle.net if you're looking to pick it up on the PC. And that's the show. That's the show, everybody. Hey, thanks for watching another episode of Roundtable Live. We appreciate you. Uh, we are seeing a surge of support over on the Patreon, so we want to say thank you very much to those of you who have oh, been supporting you. over on patreon.com slash roundtable. We sincerely appreciate that. You can, of course, follow the show here on Twitch. That is twitch.tv slash roundtable podcast. We air every Friday at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern. And uh, you can follow the show on Twitter as well. It's at Roundtable PC. There's a show discussion subreddit over on roundtablepodcast.reddit.com. And as I mentioned, of course, patreon.com slash roundtable. We want to thank the or, uh, we want to thank those patrons over there on patreon.com slash roundtable at that $20 tier and above, which include Julian Avalsgard, Jonathan Graham, Scrotty 119, Todd Buckley, Ricky Grist, Cowboy Chemist, Eric Schooley, Stephen Aoki, Metadata Studios, James P, Peter Sinison, Ellis Spice, John Kalchik, O Thomas Games BR, Jakar Sampson with the dance number, Colnar, Sanoa, Joseph Boss, Pendulette, Michael Bush Larson, Talks to Wall, uh, TJ Majesty, Chaos, Chorus Times Two, <laughs> Chorus Times Two Theorist. He's just. He's just not even putting the effort in anymore. Colby Klein, <laughs> Greenlight, Orin Saltzman, Bristlebrit, Positron, Mythscara, Mediocrities, Justin Summerfett, and Logan Ray. All of the thanks to you guys. Thank you so much for keeping the show going over there on Patreon. Really appreciate it. Thank you to our subscriptions as well here on Twitch. That includes Dr. Benton Quest, Nekasol, uh, Spleeby. That's a fun name. Joe Cafal, Captain Sharpie Guy, Rob Boberts, Raj again, Skiff, Benson, and Hodges. Thank you guys very much for your subscriptions and resubscriptions here on Twitch. Appreciate y'all supporting the show any way you can. We thank you very much for watching. And we'll be back next week to talk Mario. We're going to be talking our October game of the month, which should be a very, very interesting conversation next week. We're all here next week, right? Nope. Nope. Uh oh. <laughs> I'll be at BlizzCon. Oh, BlizzCon. Okay. No more mm. cons. Jeez. I thought that got <laughs> I thought con season was over, but yeah, I guess not. Not Shoot. yet. Almost. We're getting there. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we'll have a uh Actually in reality, con season just doesn't end anymore. Doesn't I end. Because mm-hmm. oh, like purple. a month and a half after BlizzCon is PAX South. All right. Oh god. Oh, yeah. Wow. And... Let's get Gabe Newell on the show or somebody sure. just to fill it. <laughs> right, yeah. You know, I might try to no, no, let me uh, put him on the spot or anything, but Austin, I'm sure, will be uh, head over heels about Mario, so we might have to bring him on to talk Mario Shop with us, so that'll be fun. Or We'll figure it out. Mario Shop. Mario Is Shop. that a new game featuring Mario? Because it sounds like it could it be. It's part of the Mario fun. Odyssey, actually. Okay. Anyway, that'll do it for this episode of Roundtable Live. We'll figure it out it next week, but uh, oh my god, he's got it. I, played, I haven't unwrapped it yet. I've played a bit, actually, and it is it's deserving of the praise. It is very fun. Six out of five? Good. It's six out of five, I'd say. Yeah, that's a, it's a pretty safe bet. Thanks for watching, everybody. We appreciate it. We'll be back next week. Thank you for being here, and we'll send goodbye. Should I lick goodbye. my cartridge? Yes. Yes. Test, taste it. <laughs>